Um, I guess uh, the best place to start for us, uh, because of the nature of this podcast, we kind of talk about everything, and mm. this part is going to be um, more related to entrepreneurship side of things. Right. And uh, I guess we can start with um, a little bit of intro of who you are, if you don't mind to introduce yourself. Sure. Currently, what who I am now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> who have you become? <laughs> okay. Well, not, right now I am uh, Mark Rothman, and I'm the director. Uh, of Top Secret Comedy Club, and uh, which I started ten years ago, and um, yeah, that's, I guess that's that's my business mm-hmm. position. I'm also I also uh, own a property in Hackney, and a, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. A real estate guy. <laughs> well, yeah, not, I wouldn't call myself real estate. That sounds like uh, yeah, that's the whole of my life. It's just mm-hmm. a little little chunk of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So, uh, with your Top Secret Comedy Club, which I've been to, which is amazing, and... They have to do that stuff. <laughs> no, honestly, well, yeah. I loved it. So, I, I haven't been to many uh, mm. comedy clubs, but I've enjoyed it. It's a very relaxing atmosphere, and you can actually mm. just enjoy the jokes, mm. and you don't have that, you know, social pressure. It's like, oh, you can't say that. So mm. You just feel very relaxed. Um, plus, it's based in central London, <laughs> just a few doors from here. Yeah, Drury Lane. Drury Lane. <laughs> Link well, in the description. Down, just in case you want to come there. It's just Google Top Secret. <laughs> it, it pops up, boom, yeah, yeah. top of the line straight away. Yeah. Uh, over over 4,000 reviews? Uh, 3,000. Oh, yeah, on, on, on Google, mm-hmm. just over 3,000. Yeah, which is freaking We just did 3,000, we just got a 3,000 3, 3, 3, uh, review uh, last week. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess we can start with how the beginning of your life, really, or when you started, um, it's been many years ago, but what have you been doing, kind of how did your path lead to where you are now, to the comedy? Um, yeah, well, where do you want to start? I mean, uh, at, um, let me think about, at seven years old, mm-hmm. I started selling sweets. Was it? No, seven, was it seven? Oh no! I, I mean, I started trying to make money very young. Really? So yeah, cool. seven years old. I used to go. My mum left me. Uh, she used to go and work, and we, me and my sister, used to be left uh, in this kind of summer resort place. It's a caravan kind of uh, resort on the <laughs> northeast coast, and I used to go to the uh, to the arcade. Mm-hmm. And I used to get a candy floss stick. I used to go into all the machines when the mechanics weren't looking. When the mechanics weren't looking, I used to go around the arcade, go into the machines, and there was always money under there, because there were always pennies and two pennies used to roll under there, Jeez. get some money out. And I used to take the few pennies or two pennies that I got, and I used to go on the pushing machines, And uh, but I could see, I learned quickly when the pushing machine was going to drop. Mm-hmm. And then I used to just, I, know when they were gonna, I knew when they were, were going to drop. I was really good at that. Mm-hmm. So as long as I had like three or four pence, I was going to get more. So sometimes I used to push in, like uh, somebody would be on there, mm-hmm. and, I, and then I just know when it's going to drop. So I go, "Excuse me, can I have a go, please?" <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> you, you and yeah, and if they thought that I was cute, you know, they'd let me go on, and I'd win the money, you know. <laughs> and if they thought I was a little annoying and arsehole, they'd say, "No, bugger off, you know, you little bastard," you know. <laughs> uh, so I start making money about that age, doing that. And also, you could in those days you had recy- recycled bottles as well. You don't do it anymore, but you used to be able to go in the bins mm-hmm. and get and get um, lemonade bottles out of the bins and take them and get them get the money back in the shops. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they should bring yeah. them back. Back in the day, yeah, that's before. Yeah, in the seventies, you could do that. All right. Yeah. So yeah, I started doing that, and then uh, I was a bit older, and I think I was about nine or ten. I uh, I lived next to a farm. I mm-hmm. used to go and get the syringes from the farm. I used to have these syringes which used to inseminate cows with. They used to have bull. <laughs> Bull spunk and I ate these syringes, big syringe. and so I used to get those out of the yeah. bins and wash them and then take them to school and sell them. I was about when I was about Are nine, or, nine or ten, yeah. So I, I was, sell I was, them for what? Sell them Just to put water in, squirt so friends could use them to squirt oh. each other water. I <laughs> had <laughs> a bit of bull spunk in there mixed in there. <laughs> <Good luck. laughs> when my mum found out I was doing it, she thought you better wash those first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first. First week or two, they just literally had a bit of spunk in there as well. People was spreading themselves. With. <laughs> you, got, you gotta start somewhere. Yeah. Well, as a kid, as, as a teenage kid in in uh, Yorkshire, I used to do bits of job. I used to paper round. You know, mm-hmm. all my all my mates used to have a paper round. I had the hardest one in my little town. I, I had the hardest, the worst one, worst one from, from the tightest. I had the tightest news agents. He used to give. Mm-hmm. He, he, I got the lowest wages and the biggest sack of, of uh, papers. Danby's horrible man. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, and we used to do a thing as well. This is you won't. This is way before your time. There used to be a, a camp called Butlins. Butlins. You wouldn't know what it was. It's basically in the in after the war. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy set up these camps in 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 a uh, in ex military camps some camps which would be military training camps okay. he made them into hol- holiday camps so he'd have all these <laughs> have all these chalets he'd have all these chalets so he'd build a big swimming pool and build an entertainment block and mm-hmm. you know, have a fun fair there and, and build entertainments but people would stay in the blocks which were originally for the military I see so he's called Butlin Billy Butlin this guy and, he, and then he set these big camps up and all the working class people in the whole country used to go on holiday to these camps so in Yorkshire at the time there was a huge mining community in West Yorkshire mm-hmm. in, in all these in, in West Yorkshire where there's all the coal mines were there yeah. and they used to come to, to the coast for the holidays literally not you know maybe 60, 60 miles or something miles that was a holiday for the summer 67 miles to Butlins and every Saturday they used to come in mm-hmm. for a week and then they used to go home the next week and they get new set of campers it was very it's a really different world to now <laughs> used to get a lot of miners yeah. coming down from scotland as well people coming down from scotland from scotland yeah because we were on the coast and mm-hmm. so i got a job at butlins for a couple of seasons i used to get a job as a as a barrel boy and every saturday when the campers came when the campers came in you used to take their cases you used to say oh, do you want me to take your cases you take the cases to the chalet and in the morning in the morning on saturday morning you take the ca- cases from the chalet to the, to the car park where they used mm-hmm. to get their, their buses it was really working class you used to take their t- take their um take their bags in the morning from white camp or blue camp or yellow camp and you take them to the, to, 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 to the big car park what? drop the cases off and then in the afternoon all the campers arrive yeah. and then you put take them back in the afternoon take all the ca- all the cases oh, right. back to the back to the. Uh, and do you get like pids or constant? It was tip, it was, no, it's tips. tips. The, the, the Butlins didn't give you any wage. You just got tips from the guys who you're carrying carrying your cases for. All Butlins gave you was a barrow. And the extraordinary thing was there was about there was about forty barrels barrows. Mm-hmm. So about forty lads used to go and do this job. Yeah. Job called you call a barrow boy, mm-hmm. and you used to get these barrows. But only about five of the barrows were actually any good. <laughs> so, so what you had to do is you had to go there first thing in the morning. We, mm-hmm. me and my mates, we were the hardcore kids we, mm-hmm. me and my mates so i don't know what we maybe i don't know a bit more go hardcore and we were always the ones that got up earlier so we used to get up at four o'clock in the morning cycle to butlins like a couple of miles three miles cycle cycle to butlins get there for dawn and then get that get those good those five barrows there's five good ones we used to get them and sit on them and then what? wait and wait until the camp opened at eight eight o'clock and so then we used like to go at eight four hours yeah you just certainly barrow fall asleep get back to sleep whatever and then all the other kids used to come later and get the shitty barrels. But then that give you a huge get to get that good barrel used to give you a huge earning potential. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what a weird world. It was a very really? very strange world, yeah. And then uh, and then um I did I remember I said to the security because the security guards uh, mm-hmm. at the gate, I said, Hey guys, why don't you just invest in some better barrows and then we won't have to get up here at four in the morning? Why don't you just, you know, get thirty good barrows and the customers will get a be- you know, better service, we'll have good barrows. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we don't have to skip at four in the morning. Wouldn't it make, just make sense to get some better barrels for everybody? Yeah. And like, do you want this job or not? <laughs> shut your mouth, shut your face. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. They took a bar to raise your head yeah, in the workplace. Like, yeah, yeah, they didn't like that at all. A little, 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 you know, we, we were like 13 years old. when you, We were 13 years old to get that job. I mean, very young. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they didn't like me maybe suggesting anything which is more efficient <laughs> you cheeky little you. bastard <laughs> shut up do you want the job or not i'll tell the manager who'll get rid of you <laughs> sure. yeah, yeah. Uh, there's i bet there's like plenty of people sh- who want to do the shop. job still um it was it was a very funny little place and also you had you had to work for tips and a lot of the lads didn't i i caught on very quickly the tip thing you weren't allowed to ask for money you had to say it was for tips but what i used to do i, used to, I had a little speech i used to say they say how much of that uh, they used to get to the bottom of the thing they say how much of that son and you were supposed to say oh just for tips mm-hmm. and they give you whatever and i say oh i say oh we're working for tips however the uh, i used to say a little speech i said uh, i always remember the wording it was like however the recommended standard tip from white camp is two pounds <laughs> you know <laughs> so i just had a little speech and they said what and i said the recommended standard tip for white from white camp is two pounds they used to give me two pounds you yeah. know because i didn't tell them they had, i just said the recommended standard tip all right. That's just my own little speech I made up. <laughs> and, and if you, if you, so I used to make more than anybody else because I had this little speech. That's <laughs> my first bottling speech. And two pounds, how much was it back then? Was oh, it, back then. I mean, money? this was this is like, uh, what year was this? It's about 13, so I'd have been, it's about 1980. It's about 1980, 1980, 1980 so two pounds. So let's think. In those days, uh, it would be Mars Bar was 14 pence, maybe 15 pence for Mars Bar. So now sixty. So now the sixty pence, aren't they? Yeah. Well, depends on where you go. But yeah. Yeah. So that's so two pounds would have been about 
uh, four times as much, maybe so two pounds like eight pounds, maybe. That's I a good tip. Yes, I used to get about, yeah, I used to get 80 quid on a good day. I used to get, uh, sorry, 20 quid, 20 pounds on a good day. So I was earning the equivalent of 80 pounds a day for a 14 year old kid. I was like, <laughs> this is not bad. <laughs> yeah, we, we felt like kings, you know. We were like, whoa, <laughs> you know, this is amazing money. Also, I used to go to the arcades as well. These had a lot of amusement arcades there. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the mechanisms were very simple. They had really simple mechanisms on these arcades. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously, now they're much more complicated. But in those days, you could do really simple cons. So, you could con the mechanisms and make money out of that as well. So, you, there's all these different cons. You could have a, mm -hmm. uh, on a video game, you had a penny up con where you, you put a penny in the reject slot and flick it up, flick up the reject slot, and it would flick up the reject over into the mechanism and then give you a credit. So you could play a video game for one pence instead of 10 pence. Video games are 10 pence a go. Uh, so you could flick a, it's called, it's called penny, <laughs> we, we, we call it penny up, penny up. Flick a penny up the reject slot, penny Jesus up. Christ. Worked on midway sense. machines, midway. Awesome. <laughs> Those are space invaders. And, uh, and Galaxians. Kids nowadays don't have a, don't stand a chance against those machines. No, and, no, they changed all the mechanisms last week. <laughs> <laughs> Quite them for like for a generation. And they had another, fruit, they had fruit machines where they had these. Um, you had a, a thin slot where you put ten p in, mm -hmm. and then a little reject slot below it with a reject button in the middle, mm -hmm. and you put a matchstick in in the top one, which filled the gap. Mm -hmm. In the in the mechanism, so you basically put two pence, rolled a two pence over the top of this matchstick, and it, a two pence would act as a ten pence. So you could play a fruit machine for two pence instead of ten pence, and then you just empty out, empty out. <laughs> so you fill it with two pences, and you, and when by the time you've finished, you've em you've emptied out the whole the whole the whole uh, tube of ten pences in the payout and the payout relay. And you get all the get basically empty fruit machine. So you just play on that for, for an hour and you just empty it of money. <laughs> you leave just load two peas in there. <laughs> so I used to do that quite a lot as well. Mm -hmm. So I was making good money those days at like 14. Okay. Well, I was really into making money. I love making money. Clearly. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know what I was doing when I was 14. Yeah. No, definitely not that. <laughs> so yeah. what, what, what happened next then? Oh, you... God. We had so many cons at Butlins as well. We had another con as well. <laughs> God, I'll tell you this story. This is a brilliant one. Because one of, our, one of my friends in, the, in our little circle, uh, Matthew Asquith, his brother used to work in one of the arcades in Butlins. Mm -hmm. And one day Matthew Asquith found a key on his brother's floor, saw this key and just picked it up. So we took it to the arcade he worked on, just played around with this key. And we found it was one of the master keys for all the machines. So we could just go in there, get this master key, open a video, press a little relay and get some credits on. And I was always much better at doing that than my mates. I so these, I used to be running around and my mates go, can you give us a game list? And I used to run with a key and give them, I used to be running around giving my mates keys. I want to play a game myself. Just give me a fucking break, you know. I need to fucking... be 2p. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. No, I didn't charge them. It was just, but then we found out that well, this master key, as well as doing all the videos, also it did a couple of cash boxes as well. There was a, there was a, there was a, there was a it was this little um, ride. You know those little rides you put kids on and they sort of go around. There was a ride outside, just outside the arcade. We noticed it did the cash box there, mm -hmm. so uh, so we we uh, one day we basically we knew when they would empty the cash box. It used to empty on a Saturday, mm -hmm. so we went down on a Friday, uh, the day before it was emptying, and then uh, we set up a little things. There's, there's about five of us in our little gang, so so um, one 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 guy was the lookout basically. One guy was the lookout. Two guys were inside basically. Uh, ask, telling the mechanics that they had a problem with some machines just to take just to take the, just to you know get them out of the way, um, and then. Oh, there's a couple of lookouts, and then I was the one who had to go and bloody do the box. <laughs> so I just had a bag, a plastic bag. You're the one who gets yeah. down if something goes so down. So I went and right? went to the key. You know, they were distracted. The guys, the mechanics were distracted. I cut the lookouts. I went over there, opened the, opened the, opened the cash box, emptied the cash box into a bag, put the cash box in, locked it, and went off with the bag. And then we had this massive bag of 10p pieces. They were huge. <laughs> the 10p were much bigger in those days. Mm -hmm. And then we went off to count the money. And we put the money on this. We went off to Primo's Valley. It's a little local place mm -hmm. to count the money put the money we put the money in a big pile it's about five or six of us sat around this money and i started doling out the money one by one mm -hmm. and then and then people go no it's taking too long it takes too long it's taking too long it's like what just gone let's just <laughs> yes we get all get an equal share here. no yeah. it's taking too long and one guy just put his hand in and then suddenly everyone just jumped into the money we, we grabbed it we we're shoveling it into our pockets so i was the closest i got the most i was just shoveling it in so we did a little scams just like that you we only did that once we only did that once and then um, <laughs> Matthew Asker got really freaked out because his brother—it was his brother's key. Yeah. So he one day he went. Um, he goes, "Oh, Mark, I can't do this anymore. I'm really worried. If we get caught, it's going to come back on my brother." He goes, "I'll just sell you the key. Like, I'll sell you. It. it can be yours. Just I'll sell it to you for for ten pounds, right?" And so I went, "Oh no, I, I, not ten. I give you five. 
<laughs> <laughs> he goes, come on, we just sneaked all that money last week. You could have got 10 pounds. You know, it's easy worth 10 pounds. I said, I'll give you eight. And he goes, you know what? Fuck it. I don't want the money. And he threw it in the boating lake. <laughs> He's really cute in his boating lake. <laughs> and so I was like, shit. <laughs> I tried to remember where it went. And, I, and the next day we were out rowing around the boating lake trying to, trying to find it. We never found it. It's gone. <laughs> A, a one valuable loss, lesson about the I know, not haggling. I should yeah. always pay uh, if, you know, don't haggle at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> Get an hour to quit haggling. Like, yeah, I'll I know. Take it, thank you very much. Terrible. <laughs> uh, so that was when you were 13, 14? Yeah, 14, 14, yeah. And then, yeah, I think, yeah, we had all sorts of scams going on in those days. There's another, there's one later when I was 15, 16. We, you could take the uh, electric lighter out of a, out of a, you know, uh, a, a lighter, uh, you know, a cigarette lighter. Yeah. You could take the electric, if you electric light, you could take the electric part out and it gave a little spark. Yeah. yeah. Like a, st a static spark. And you could take that lighter and go around some arcades and just kind of flick it on the, on a certain machines. In those days, you flip, I don't know how we found this out. I've got no idea how we discovered it, but um, we were just trying all sorts of stuff. So you flick this thing <laughs> on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on a machine and it would, and it kind of gives it a spark to the machine and it would do all sorts of weird stuff. Some videos, it would turn the screen upside down, or some some videos that would give you credits. It was so weird. It, it just it screw, some, sometimes it would screw up machines yeah. completely. So we had to go and turn the machine off and turn it on again. <laughs> and then, but sometimes it would give you credits on on video games. So we could play videos for free. But also, I found a really old fruit machine uh, where if you clicked this spark underneath one of the buttons mm -hmm. that you pressed on on one of the on the console, it would just pay out your pound a pound in tens. Do, 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 so that was a great scam. We didn't for, for a couple of years. I was living off that scam, just, just <laughs> going down this arcade, and I was like fifteen. I think I was fifteen years old at that point, fifteen, sixteen. Just that. I mean, I was living off that money. I'd go and, I if I needed imagine. some money, I was going on the arcade, click it. It used to make a funny. It used to be click out, give me a pound. We just empty it out, ten pounds done. Off we go. Oh, I actually had a gambling. Game. I got a gambling addiction at that point as well. I used to. I used to gamble. Fifteen. Yeah, I because I had all this all this. 10p pieces coming in and then I, I used to go to an arcade and start I started gambling mm -hmm. and then uh, I got a problem and I started gambling all this money away mm -hmm. and uh, for about three months I used to steal money from one arcade using a special lighter go to another arcade and gamble it and then run out of money and go back to the other arcade and it took me I think it was maybe less than two or three months it took me I think maybe two months to work out what I was doing was transporting money <laughs> from one, one arcade, arcade to, to another, another arcade yeah. and as soon as I realised that I was at my I didn't gamble any I was it I solved my gambling addiction like that it's so that was weird great. yeah I like, kind of it took me I think it, because I was getting the money so easily it made me, mm -hmm. and from one arcade it made it, it made me easy, it made it easier to work out this gambling thing it made me work out that I it, it, was, sense, it wasn't making okay. sense, yeah, because I wasn't getting it. I was just, I was going down there, and basically all I was doing was working for one arcade, taking money from one arcade to another. That's all I was doing. I was just literally transporting money from another. Double agents. Well, it's just <laughs> complete waste of my time, you know. So yeah. And, uh, and how does the kind of creative part comes into it? Because uh, I know you've been uh, a street performer for a while. So how do you go from a person who's very entrepreneurial, and you know, you find all these ways of uh, making money one way or another? to being a person who's, uh, you know, very entertaining and very creative on that side of things. Because I always think there are two kind of different... Well, I, don't, I mean, street performance isn't that creative. It's not as, you know, it's nowhere near as creative as, you know, someone might write a, write a sitcom or write something, you know, spectacular. Mm -hmm. I mean, street shows, are, in the commercial side of it, I mean, I mean you can do have a really creative street shows, of course, mm -hmm. but it tends to be that the creative ones aren't even that money making you know i mean the the money making shows are usually more standard you know the mm -hmm. like like anything that makes money it's kind of for the mass mass a mass audience you know mm -hmm. so in the streets yeah. in the streets uh, uh, a mass audience is usually goes to more simple street shows mm -hmm. so i was i mean i wouldn't say i was particularly creative as a street performer I, just, I you know i went for the money you know uh -huh. i mean a lot of street performers uh, I, I mean, I know this from other street performers that, you know, they're pissed off because I was always into money, you know, they don't like it because it was, it was very frowned upon to be into money. It was more it, people, it was, much, you know, there's much more status in having a creative street show, a creative street show in, 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 in our, in our community is that if you had a creative street show that didn't make much money, you had much more status in the community than, than someone who made loads of money with mm -hmm. a kind of, with a kind of generic street show. You know, I guess that makes so I was I was happy to, to have a low status <laughs> generic money making street show. I didn't mind. That. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had some. I, I mean, I'm probably 
talking myself down. They did have some nice bits in my street show. My street show was funny, no <laughs> doubt about it. It was entertaining. Um, and that was the creative aspect, I guess, of it. But the tricks in it weren't particularly inventive. My tricks weren't very, weren't. Uh, and when did you start on the... Doing the streets? Yeah. Um, well, I did... Um, I, I went to university and, I, and, I, and in university I fell into this kind of bohemian scene in university mm -hmm. which was which and juggling was a part of that scene I was, I was squatting in university I, I used to squat in London squat. Uh, you don't know what squatting is okay well in London in the 80s it wasn't the same as it is now the property market wasn't like it is now in London in the 80s there's lots of empty property lots of empty property property wasn't worth jack shit in the 80s in London it wasn't it wasn't a valuable commodity like it is now and it was and it was and, and there was lots of landlords just didn't bother to do their places up, they just couldn't be bothered, it wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. The rent wasn't enough to, 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 to justify doing a place up. So there's lots of lazy landlords or lots of lazy authorities who just had lots of empty property. And there was a, a, a hundred thousand people were squatting in London at the time. Ah, squatting, so you basically squatting, yeah. go into so you, get into you go into an empty building yeah. and you go, right, well, nobody's living here, mm -hmm. I'm going to live here. And you put a new lock on the door and it's your house. And you get the, you get the electricity so it turned on. I was squatting for six years in London. What? Yeah, yeah. In in that squatting scene, in, in 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 the squatting scene, which was you know really vibrant in the seventies and the eighties in London, it was a very vibrant scene. Lots of music was getting made. Like the Clash came out of that. You know the Clash. No, you don't know anything about this. The, I'm sorry. I'm the Sex Pistols, all these punk <laughs> bands, yes. all these punk bands came out of the squatting scene, uh -huh. and and uh, Mick Dex's Midnight Runners. All this, so many, so much. Uh, bloody Boy George. Mm -hmm. You know, Boy George. I heard. Yeah, I mean, that. so many people came out of the squatting scene who who were. It was it was a very bohemian scene, mm -hmm. and it was uh, you didn't have to pay rent, and it was just a, a, it's full of artists and full of bohemians, mm -hmm. full of music makers. But uh, I mean, well, I was playing drums as well in that scene, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and but also was, there was a, a little segment of that scene was into juggling as well. Juggling oh, okay. sort of made it a, a re a re it became it came like like a there was a re I don't know. It, it came back in, in, in vogue, juggling. Well, it was a kind of underground vogue, if you know what I'm saying. It's kind of, it came on like an underground vogue scene of jugglers in the, in the squatting scene. So, so uh, there's a place called Circus Space in London, which is now very kind of corporate, and they do a degree there, a degree in, um, in circus skills. And that started out as a squat. It had a squat. Well, so okay. it's kind of like all these things came from this underground squatting scene mm -hmm. and so I started juggling in that scene as well mm -hmm. as playing music I, I did quite a lot of juggling and then from there I went traveling with my hippie mates and we played music in the streets and started juggling in the streets and then from then we started doing little shows and, and mm -hmm. I started doing a little solo show from that okay so that's kind of but so uh, let's go through the timeline. So you, you were about 17, 18, then you started to go to university. Yeah, I went to university at 17, 18, UCL. Okay. Oh. And then I started squatting uh, after my first year. Mm -hmm. So I was about 18, 19, 19, 18, 19 after the first year. And I started squatting in Kids Cross to start with mm -hmm. and then Hackney. And Why? Huh? Why? Yeah. Because right. I didn't want to pay any rent. Because <laughs> what was the point of paying rent? I could have squat. I heard about squatting, and I was like, "Wow, this is this sounds like a good deal." Mm -hmm. I had some mates. I had some friends who were who were in my hall's residence, and then and they had some friends who were squatting in kin, in Kings Cross mm -hmm. in their block of flats. I was like, "What the hell is this? This is, sounds amazing." And they were like, "I was talking to my mates who were in halls. Mm -hmm. we were in this shitty hall in Grafton Way, it's just just up the road. It was just kind of shittiest. It was a, quite. A, it was quite a shitty hall." Also, you had to share rooms as well. I was sharing room with, the, with, the, with somebody else I'd never met. So oh. it's kind of different to how it is now. Yeah, definitely. They just put you in a room with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, I was putting in this medic called Jamie McCormack. You can put this on the thing. A medic called Jamie McCormack is probably now a doctor. And every morning he used to wank when I was in bed. <laughs> and my bed was like a few feet away from me. There was a fucking wank. And in Jamie McCormack, piece of shit. <laughs> I had him wank in the morning. Fuck off. Anyway, and how long that did la that last? I was in like there for three, three terms. Yeah, three terms. Yeah, listen to this guy masturbating. Fuck <laughs> me. So yeah, so at the, but the end of the third term, I heard about this squatting scene, and I was like, said so to my mates, you can, you can, you can get into a house and you can live for free in London. I'm like really? Yeah, we went and checked out this flat in Kings Cross, mm -hmm. in a place called Winford House in Kings Cross, mm -hmm. which still exists. That place, council block. And then there was a there was an empty flat around the corner in the same block. Mm -hmm. So the next night we squatted it. <laughs> we 
we were in there. We had a we had a flat. And did you have any issues like police coming in trying? To no, not not that first. You? We had issues later on. We got yeah. So one time we, when we were squatting a place, the police came. But once you got a place and it's squatted, yeah, then it's it's th 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 at that time you had certain rights. There was no there's no law against trespass, and there's there are rights. And there's no you, in those days squatters had rights. Uh, wow. It's different to now. Those rights are gone now. Okay. But in those days, you, squatters had certain rights. So you couldn't, once you had a house and you had your own key on the door, it's your home. And you couldn't evict somebody just when, without a court order. So you had to go, they had to go to court to get you out. Okay. So it's a process. So, you, you know, it would take you three or four months. If, if you were squatting somewhere, it would take them three or four months of to the legals to get you out. So you'd have a place for three or four months. But very often, the place were in such bad disrepair, they, they were happy to have you there anyway. Because you, at least you keep, you know, you fix the roof and you stop the water coming in to, and, yeah, and it keeps the place, you know, it keeps the place from getting damp and mouldy and in a way some landlords, some local authorities were happy to have you there rather than just have the, the building become derelict. Because once, 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 once the place is empty, they usually, they usually, you know, the, the, the building just deteriorates once it's empty. That's a weird time. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun. It was a great time. So it was a great scene. Um, at that time, yeah, it's really vibrant. All right, so you, so yeah, so, so, so the timeline was yeah. timeline started squatting, started juggling, um, started travelling. Mm -hmm. So by the time I finished university, I was also selling hash at university as well. I sold hash, you know, uh, for a couple of years, and that, a couple of years after university, I sold hash. That was a bit a bit of entrepreneurship as well. I um, I didn't, you didn't make a huge amount of money from it, but you know, it was, easy, it was an easy little job, you know, as long as you didn't get caught. Uh, and then, um, but it, it's not, it wasn't a job for me. I didn't, I was a bit, I was too neurotic to do that job. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it really. What did you study in university? Chemistry. Uh, um, I didn't do much work at the university. I was just messing around, squatting, and you know, trying to be cool, you know, I was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Were you uh, passed with a degree or you? Yeah, I got a just got a degree, I got a third. I got a third in chemistry, yeah, from I didn't UCL. Know exists. <laughs> huh? I didn't know a third exists. Yeah, you get a first, a two one, two two, a third, and then a, then a pass, and then a fail. So I got one one grade above a pass. Yeah, not it's not. It's it, terrible. It it's it was constant. I didn't do any work. It wasn't bad. Oh, very little work. Mm -hmm. But you know, I actually regret not doing any work. I should have taken what? my well, because you know, I, I could have had a, it's a big opportunity I missed there. But I was too young. I was too, you know, I was, I was too foolish at that time. All right, so you finished the university. So I finished university. Uh, I was doing quite, I was quite a reasonably okay juggler then, mediocre juggler by then. And I started going traveling with my friends. And then we started doing, you know, bits of busking as a group. Mm -hmm. And by about the age of, you know, by the age of 20, 23, I started doing, was it 23? Maybe yeah, I started doing a little, 23, 24, started doing little shows. Mm -hmm. on, uh, solo shows, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just around uh, Covent Garden? No, 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 no. I was doing just... stuff in France. I started doing stuff in France and Belgium. Uh, oh, in wow. France to start with. In France, um, it was kind of acceptable. It was accepted in France that you could go to a, a, a cafe, mm -hmm. which usually had a terrace outside, mm -hmm. and entertain the terrace. It was kind of like a cultural acceptance that you could go up to a terrace and go, hey guys, you could go up and play music or, you know, you know, it's, cl it's a classic cliche. The, the, the violinist comes up and plays violin. Mm -hmm. Well, so I could go up to a terrace and say, hey guys, uh, mesdames, hey, mesdames, et chers, je vais faire le spectacle pour, pour, pour vous. And I'm going to do a little show for you. And then, you know, just do a little show in French and here's some tricks, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, and just do some silly tricks. And then they, and then say, hey, if you enjoyed what I just did, I'm going to come around with a hat. And it was, it was kind of amazing because you had a, a captive audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Couldn't escape because you're sitting at a terrace, you know. And then, <laughs> and then before you knew it, they had a hat in their face and they were having to give you a bit of money to get rid of you, you know. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a little bit. It's just a way of, it was, it was kind of a way of scamming money out, money out of people at a terrace. But also, it kind of gave you a little, a little road into doing some performance, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was just a little way of, of having an audience and doing something. And how did you go from London to France and to Belgium and to just, can you just travel back then? Oh yeah, I mean it's, you know, that was, I can't remember. The first time I went over there was, I don't remember, I think we just got the bus or hitchhiked or, I can't remember. I don't, I don't remember why I got over there. Just, it wasn't, I think the first time I went over there, uh, the first time I went over there, I don't know, I might have hitchhiked over there. Or got a bus. Yeah. I had money anyway. It wasn't money wasn't an issue. I might have got the bus or a train or something. Oh, why money wasn't an issue. Sorry. Why money? Wasn't well, I had money. I had money. I always had money. Mm. I always had money on me. 
I was just had money. One way or another. Huh? <laughs> One way or another. Is yeah, kind of I mean, like, I know, the money, I only had, a, didn't really have any money issues. I always had money. Apart from one time, that first year at college was when I didn't have money. The end of the first year, we got grants in those days. And then we signed on. You could sign on the holidays. You could get, you could get, um, you get money from the government in the holidays as well. But one time I didn't get any money from the government, it wouldn't come through and I was hungry. I didn't have any money for like three or four days. I did nothing. Shit. So I went hungry for a few days. That was hard. But then it kind of taught me how to not, you know, how to live very, because I, I, I didn't have any money, so I just had to live on bread and carrots. So it kind of made me realize you can actually live on bread and, bread and carrots. Is it, you know what I mean? Nothing can be worse. Than yeah, exactly, it, it, exactly. It teaches you how to survive. Yeah, it was useful actually to have that, that lesson, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you can't, ex you can't, you have to be austere sometimes, you know. Interesting. So if uh, money isn't, you say money is what motivates you and what kind of makes you interested in doing something, but at the same time you go down the road routes of um, sort of, uh, you know, street performing, that sort of things, which is not a stable income, so to speak. So no, but the, 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 the squatting scene, it wasn't just, the squatting scene what, yeah, it was more like about, um, it was it was more like a, a you know, adventurous, you, you, you exploring things. You, the idea was, I mean, you're exploring kind of freedom and exploring different ways of, 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 of so it's pretentious, it sounds so pretentious, I, I don't even <laughs> say it, you know, but it, I mean, it was a very sort of alternative scene in those days, so you didn't want to, the idea was, you didn't, the idea in the in our communities in our, those communities is, was to not play the game and not 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 be conventional and I to be and be unconventional and and don't sell out sell out uh. Uh, you know <laughs> I mean uh, the eighties because it was the eighties as well the eighties was uh, was full of people that just wanted to make money mm -hmm. but in a very sort of grotesque manner and very materialistic mm -hmm. um, and and the squatting scene wasn't really about materialist it was about the opposite really it's like mm -hmm. dropping out. And not be materialistic, mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of frowned upon to make money in that scene. So weird because you seem to be like the opposite of it. But yeah, I, you are it, it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was, I always rejected that, that kind of, uh, I always rejected that kind of mindset. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I was, I was happy to make money. I, I didn't, I, but it was frowned upon in my circles. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really accepted. I was, I was a bit kind of. Uh, I was, yeah, I was an alternative voice in the alternative scene kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but yeah, so I wasn't, I, I, you know, my, my entrepreneurial spirits weren't, weren't completely, uh, uh, suffocated by that scene. I see. Um, but that scene was generally quite, I mean, I, I, at the same time, I, I wasn't really, I was anti material I wasn't very materialistic, mm -hmm. but I was anti, but I like making money, mm -hmm. but I didn't really want money to make so much to make money for material possessions. Mm -hmm. I want to make money to give me freedom, opportunity, you know. Uh -huh. I um, so I didn't go out and buy a car or anything like that or go, you know, have a lavish lifestyle or, you know, go buy a new sofa. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was happy to live on nothing. Mm -hmm. But um, I like to have money just um, for the feeling of security, I guess, mm -hmm. and for the feeling of freedom as well. So if I needed it, I had it, you know, mm -hmm. I could, so I could always just do whatever I wanted. I see. Yeah. How do you kind of in, in that time, because you, you were young, so in your 20s, yeah. and people in their 20s are quite susceptible to social pressure. And it, it sounds like you had the social pressure of your group to be like, oh, you don't need money. Stop worrying about it. Just kind of leave off whatever you leave off. How do you keep that mindset of, I love making money, I want to keep doing it and not be subject to that, you know, pressure and just fold under it. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, I don't know. I mean, we used to have a lot of, we used to spend a lot of time talking then. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if you guys talk a lot now, young, young, we used to, we used to talk a lot to each other because we didn't have mobile phones. We used to mm -hmm. hang out every night getting stoned and drinking. We used to talk a lot mm -hmm. about politics and about, uh, life and you know i used to argue i used to argue with other other voices you know mm -hmm. and say that's bullshit you know that's ridiculous so we used to have these are you know these arguments discussions and, and jokes and we used to hang out and laugh and talk and just mm -hmm. you know be and stupid you actually have a conversation with people yeah every night like we used to chat with my fellow my mates you know we used to have big big groups all get stoned all get drunk mm -hmm. and we used to always do chat all night you know mm -hmm. chat till two in the morning but you know usually 
there's always one or two guys that start getting really serious and polit political towards the end of the night as they get more drunk <laughs> and I used to get bad I can't be arsed <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So you, uh, you, you had that opportunity to actually, because nowadays it feels like you start discussing anything kind of, you know, opposite to what other people think. You know, like you have a group of people and you start yeah. saying an opinion which is not a uh, what the group thinks, so to speak. And they kind of start, try to shake you off or try to push you into their point of view. That wasn't the case then. You just kind well, of it was a little bit. I mean, I, yeah, you just get judged. I used to get judged for sell, you know, for making money out of selling hash you know mm -hmm. people used to say oh you shouldn't make money from it <laughs> it's like, but then you know the very same people used to used to then start selling hash and making more money from it you know selling it for more expensive you know it's just it was always a lot of hypocrisy you know uh, that's how i think yeah, it's just typical behavior <laughs> yeah i remember there's a couple of, couple of mates who you used to be really down on me for selling hash and making money from it and said oh you should you know you should you should make it should be zero it should be non-profit making <laughs> they're not for profit yeah yeah and then i was like well i can't do that because otherwise i wouldn't bother doing it <laughs> you know and then, but then subsequently a couple of years later they started selling hash i remember and they started selling hash for more money i was selling than they used to make more profit than me so that's just like an animal farm situation you know I people see, yeah you know jesus christ <laughs> people yeah um, but that's just you know that's just it's a funny old scene okay um and so yeah so the, the timeline was yeah so i did that i stopped doing that uh, as when i was 24 i didn't mm -hmm. want to do it anymore because i just because I, I, i stopped smoking as well i stopped drinking about that age what huh or why um well what happened is i went to I, um i went to brazil um i met a, uh, a friend of mine was going to brazil mm -hmm. this guy called john carlo and um and he said oh i'm going to brazil he's a bit of a crazy guy And um, and I was already already had a really um, I was already getting a bit depressed with my lifestyle sort of thing. I was starting to get depressed and because it, it always takes out of you that kind of lifestyle. You're getting stoned every night and drinking every night. It just kind of takes it just takes away your happy chemicals. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I was getting a bit depressed, and I didn't know. I wasn't quite sure why. I couldn't work it out. Mm -hmm. um, but then um, John Carlo said, "Oh, I'm going to go to." Um, I, was, I used to work for Greenpeace as well at that time, doing voluntary work and doing a bit of paid work and a bit of voluntary work. So I was really into the environment as well mm -hmm. and, um, and into environmental issues. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then my friend John Carlson, said, I'm going to go to Brazil and go traveling around Brazil. I'm going to go to travel to the rainforest. Um, so I said, oh, I'd love to do that. Sounds great. I, 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 can I join you? He goes, yeah, come, come over. Yeah. He goes, I'll be in Rio on this date. Here's some telephone numbers. You'll be able to catch me. I'll be at my mother. I'll be at this friend's, this friend's, this friend's. My mother's in Argentina. I might pop down to her. So here's her number. Here's some numbers. And then, yeah, come to Rio and I'll meet you on this day. I said, look, okay, I'll come to Rio. I've got my flight. Uh, I'll meet you on this, this such and such a day. I'll be at Rio Airport. There's my flight. That's my flight number. There's my time. I'll meet you there. Because I really wanted to go see the rainforest because I was mm -hmm. into kind of Greenpeace and I was into the environment. I thought it'd be a really good thing to see the rainforest and see that. Well, what's, what's going on there, there yeah. it wasn't so much why it was there because i you know i wanted to even you know maybe help with some voluntary work and help mm -hmm. you know help uh slow down the destruction of it at the time because mm -hmm. a lot of vlogging was going on mm -hmm. so the idea was i go up there he was really into this um into a cult or into a group calls uh, into like this thing called santa dime you ever heard of this it's a it's there's a it's got bigger now it's mm -hmm. um It's a lucigenic drug that came from the Amazon, and he wanted to go to one of these groups in the Amazon and take some Santa Dime, which is uh, like a, a, a rainforest drug that has DMT in it, oh, okay. a strong hallucinogenic. So um, I, I wasn't so into that. I just wanted to go hang out in Brazil, and so he, but he was a good mate. I could thought, well, he, you know, I'd go with him. Mm -hmm. He speaks Spanish, so he helped me get get into the, into the Amazon. So mm -hmm. I went to uh, meet him in Rio. And then I got to the airport and he, he wasn't there. <laughs> he didn't turn up. So then I went to Rio and I phoned these numbers. He gave me some numbers. I phoned these numbers desperately. And where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And one of the, one, luckily one of his friends, it was getting dark in the middle of Rio. I was getting quite scared. And one of his friends answered the phone and said, look, uh, I said, look, I'm a friend of John Carlos. He gave me this number. I, you know, can you help me out here? I'm in the middle of Rio. He's like, oh, come and stay for one night. So I went to stay with his house for one night. He was doing loads of coke and stuff. This guy, I was like, no thanks. Uh, wow. And then the next day, he sort of introduced me to, uh, he took me down to Rio and I went and stayed in a student hostel place. I went and stayed in a student hall's residence because mm -hmm. I'd had my, had my degree in chemistry. Mm -hmm. So I could sort of still play my student card. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I've just got out of college in London. Uh, 
Yeah, I did a degree in chemistry. I met a couple of other chemistry students who lived in this hostel, in a sort of hall's residence. Mm -hmm. And then they let me stay in their in their room, in their hall's residence. It was not managed. It was just basically an open open house sort of thing, massive building. Mm -hmm. And I went and stayed in one of the bunks in their room and gave them some money each day. They were lovely. These lovely Brazilian students, they're really nice. Just, they, they really took to me and I took to them. They're really lovely friends. They were nice, so lovely and warm. Mm -hmm. I stayed in their room for a couple of weeks in Rio. That's nice. And then I organised, after that I thought, right, well, here I am in Rio. <laughs> 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 what am I going to do now? And then I organised, basically I got, thought, right, I'll go to the John Carlos, don't know where he's gone. Nobody, nobody knows where he is. His mum didn't know where he was. Nobody knew where he was. So, so then I, uh, I, I thought, okay, well, I might as well hit, hit the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, I organised my first bus. I said, right, I'll get a bus to Bahia, which is like 12 hours north mm -hmm. of Rio. Uh, and then people said, yeah, you should go to Bahia. It's beautiful. So I thought, okay, I'll go to Bahia. Mm -hmm. And then I just thought, okay, I'll just go, you know, 12 hour, 12 hour, 12 hour, 12 hour, and the course of a few weeks, get, get to the Amazon. Yeah. And then um, I bought my bus ticket and I was walking through Rio and I bumped into Giancarlo in the street in Rio. It was so bizarre. And I said, hey, what's going on? <laughs> and he was like, hey man, I've been looking for you, man. I was like, yeah, I've been looking for you, dickhead. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, don't I'm looking. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I'm just with the angels right now and, and Rebecca's with me. And you know, the, I'm speaking to Rebecca right now. She's in London, but I'm talking to her. Here she is, and he's fucked. He's so fucked. He's so he's been doing Santa Dime, and he's really sometimes he's really strong, hallucinogenic, and he's just really fucked. And I was like, look, John Carlo, and he goes, yeah, man. Well, you know, you know, let's keep in touch. And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. I said, well, I'm gonna. I, got, I said, I'm gonna get the Amazon, so I'll see you later. <laughs> that's, that's last time I saw him on the oh, street in Rio. What year was that? I was 24, I think, or 23, 24. So that would have been about 24, uh, that would be 1990. 1990s. Maybe, 19, maybe 1990. It wasn't dangerous Is it? in there back then. Yeah, it was a bit dodgy, yeah. Well, that's the reason I stopped drinking. That's, that's, that's the answer to your question. So I was in, I was in Brazil and I mm -hmm. thought, you know what, this is a dodgy place. Yeah. And I did. I just. I just instinctively. I stopped drinking because I just thought I couldn't afford to. I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford the the, the risk of getting drunk. Mm -hmm. I had to keep my wits around, about me. I couldn't be getting stoned and getting drunk because uh, I was. You know, I had some travel checks on me. I didn't want to lose. You know, I, yeah. I. I was vulnerable. You know, I was on my own. So um, yeah, I just. Uh, I just didn't get drunk. I just stayed sober. And um, yeah, I went to buy a. And um, yeah, just travel. Basically, went up up, up the coast of of, of uh, Brazil. Went to, got got bus to Bahia. Stayed in a uh, little village called Trancoso, and then I got a, another bus up to um, uh, Salvador, mm -hmm. and then another bus. Stayed in a little hostel there. Went got another bus. I used to, I actually got to Maceo, another place called Maceo. I used to in the end. I was just going up to houses. I used to get a new town and just go knocking on doors and say, "Hey, uh, here I am. Do you mind put me up?" <laughs> Serious. I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a book to travel. I didn't have a, one of those Lonely Planet books. I did nothing. I was just on my own with a little tiny, tiny rucksack. So I just, uh, so I had this, I had this crazy trip. Yeah, it was a really cool trip. It's mm -hmm. the most amazing adventure. So I used to get to the next town, just knock on some doors, and they say, "Yeah, you can stay here." People were very friendly. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, it was very strange. Yeah, this it was really cool. So bizarre. Yeah, because I didn't know where to stay because I didn't have any travel book <laughs> and I couldn't afford a hotel. <laughs> so I used to no, knock on no, people's no doors. Google Maps back then, eh? Yeah. And no Google Maps back then. No Google Maps, no. So you just, I just travelled around and, and then and by the time I got to Belém, I was learning a bit of Portuguese. I didn't have a book to learn. I had a, I had a, a, a book to learn Spanish. I had a teach yourself Spanish book, which was useless. Because yeah. it wasn't because it wasn't a Spanish speaking country. So I was learning a little bit of a little Portuguese, you know, just yeah. sort of how are you? Hey, how's it going? sort of thing, hello. And I was getting a tan by then because I was because I, so I looked a bit more Brazilian. I didn't look so, you know, like a white, vulnerable guy. And then by the time I got to Belém, I was a bit more streetwise. I used to go and get, I used to go sort of get a job as well. I used to go tap on some English, uh, some schools, English teaching schools, and um, just say, hey, I'm, I'm in town for a week or two. Do you need an English teacher? And they're like, oh my God, you're English? Yeah, come in, come in. So I used to teach some kids English. They said, what do you want, what, how much do you want to earn? I was like, whatever, what do you pay? $4 an hour or whatever. So I was, you know, just make a bit of money. Travel around, Dubai, yeah. do some juggling. <laughs> it was great. This is so weird. So, you good, the so, so I traveled around the Amazon. Went to. A, I actually ended up going to a rainforest conference 
in a, we, in, a, in, in a Manaus, which is the capital of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. It was, I think it was quite a big one. Uh, was it 1990? It must be 1990. It was quite a big one. There's, the UN were there. Mm -hmm. The UN were there, and there's all these groups there. A lot of lot of awesome mineral companies and people exploiting the resources. It was a kind of like a PR thing, really, for mm. for, for the fossil industry. And uh, it was it was it was a very strange kind of affair. Mm -hmm. But I managed to get a, a job with one of the a little local charity there as well, called um, Health and Happiness, Sante Alegria. It was called. In, in, a, in a place just down the river from Manaus mm -hmm. uh, called Santarem. It was halfway between Manaus and uh, Belém. So I was there for about a month and then I got, got caught hepatitis when I was there. So then I was, uh, I was really sick for about another month and then I came home. But then, so I hadn't been getting drunk or getting stoned in Brazil for like four months. Mm -hmm. And also then I came home with the hepatitis, which stayed in the system for about eight months to a year your liver has to regrow. So then I, had, I couldn't drink anyway if I wanted to because your liver, you kill yourself. You couldn't, your liver oh, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to handle uh, had hepat hepatitis A. So your liver is recovering. So mm -hmm. by the time my liver is recovered, I, I, I'd been drinking for at least a year. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, I just I was, I didn't want to drink anymore. I was just like, this is great. Over. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, I just felt to totally, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, completely rejuvenated and I had a different worldview and I had it different view yeah i had a different everything was different about my life i just felt very different so i stopped that and also i stopped selling selling hash because it just seemed so shit once i was sober mm -hmm. it just didn't seem like anything that was worthy uh, i don't know it didn't seem like a very fun thing mm -hmm. you know so i started I did just so uh, once i was sober i just started, did load had a different life altogether mm -hmm. it was crazy different yeah, <laughs> it's only you. You only turned like twenty five. Uh -huh. It's you only were like twenty five. twenty four. Yeah, yeah. 24 and I had a huge. Time. It switched something in my brain. It totally changed. Because mm -hmm. before I went to Brazil, I, I was kind of very down on on the system. I I, I didn't. I, I I had a worldview which had me placed in the system. You know, in those days, there was no idea. You know this thing, um, uh, white privilege. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a term that was around then. It wasn't. Imagine, that, yeah. We didn't have that term. But when I when I went before I went to Brazil, I really felt like I was kind of like a a lower part of the class system in the UK, mm -hmm. and the class system was a very sort of overreaching mm -hmm. system, which meant I wouldn't be able to get anywhere because I was just a working class kid, and mm -hmm. and the system is built around not giving any opportunity to these kind of people, mm -hmm. and the whole thing is a is a is a is a conspiracy against 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 our class, and I had all these ideas yeah. in my head. And then I went to Brazil and got sober and came back and thought, fuck, I've got so much opportunity in this world. God, I'm, I, you know, the kids I saw in Brazil, they were, I saw a lot of homeless kids in Brazil who had to live off, uh, just live off the streets, live off begging for food and off restaurant tables, leftovers. They get beaten, they, you know, they'd have to go out and get mangoes off trees, throw sticks at trees to get mangoes, to eat mangoes. There's a lot of poverty in Brazil, mm -hmm. like horrendous poverty there. The, I mean, it was just horrendous, the, the, the stuff I saw out there. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that I was the fucking luckiest little fucker in the world, you know. I mean, to think, to, to, to have ever thought that I, you know, that I didn't have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Never, yeah. It, it didn't make any sense. I came back and I, my, oh, my worldview was totally smashed. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm so lucky. Wow, we are so lucky. Anybody in this country is lucky. As I came back feeling, I've got so much opportunity here. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. I can do whatever I want. I'm free. I can do this, that, and the other. I just felt so free when I came back. Or because I stopped drinking as well. So it just changed everything. It changed everything. I wasn't depressed anymore. Mm -hmm. It just shattered my whole worldview. And I guess I, I didn't have the term in my head at the time, but I think I realized I had white privilege. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I realized I was very privileged. Mm -hmm. I was so well, privileged. In comparison to, you to know, kids in to Brazil. Like, yeah. so anybody in the world, I felt so privileged, even to people in the UK, because I didn't also have a huge material thing. I, was, I came back thinking, because when I went away, I really resented people having money in the UK. I resented people get, being rich and me being poor, poor as in not having much money. Mm -hmm. I really resented their, their wealth, mm -hmm. resented their power, and resented their material position yeah. in the work in, in, in our society i resented it and i felt envious of it and i i i, I wasn't ha happy with the situation when i came back i felt very free and i felt like the idiots who 
want to buy spend a hundred grand on a on a Porsche. Yeah. If they're that stupid, that's brilliant. Just, let them spend it. I didn't. I thought you fucking idiots. You know, here I am. I'm free. If I have a hundred grand, I don't have to buy a Porsche because I don't give a fuck about a Porsche. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was a very different. Well, I just, I, I just felt very liberated. Yeah. Interesting. Fuck it. I thought if you if you want to get if you want to have a Porsche, if you have a Porsche, you're a fucking idiot. You're a fucking fool. <laughs> you're a deluded idiot. <laughs> yeah. The, the uh... so I wasn't envious anymore. I just felt. I just. I don't know. It's free. It's just changed completely. My right. view of the world. And so, what do you decide to do with your life once you're back here? Well, and then I was. So when I got back, I just. I was. I went back into one, one of my old squats. I went. Into, I went. Came back to my squat. It was actually being squatted by some other people. The guy that had been looking after my squat. Um, had actually just given it some people, some some guys from Yugoslavia. I was like, "What do you mean? This is my fucking home. What do you mean?" I, when I went to Brazil, I gave it to you, Tom, to look after this place, and now you're not living anymore. And these other guys are living here, so I had to, I had to get, I had to move back. I had to get these guys out of my house, which <laughs> took a little while. Your house? Yeah, it was my fucking house. I fucking squatted it. I squatted it. You know, You've been it's my squat. It's my possessions are in there. My, you know, they moved my shit into the basement. So said, they were like, "Well, you don't live anymore, Mark." You, you know, it's not your home anymore. I was like, yeah, it fucking is. My, uh, you know, it's in my home. I squatted it. So we had a big fucking fight about that. And I had to get these guys out of my house. I had to live in the basement for a few weeks in this little, tiny little... I wasn't going to leave. I was just like, no, it's my fucking house. So eventually we got rid of them. Eventually we got these guys out and I got my house back. And then I, was, and then I started... Um, I did a few things. I, um, I looked after some kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I got a job as an au pair for, for, for some friends that I had. Pair? Yeah, yeah, like a oh, child, child oh, minder. Yeah, yes, yeah, the, child minder. My my friend had some kids, and his his au pair walked out. So I, mm-hmm. I took over to, as an au pair. Yeah, she just she just walked out of the job, and I said, look, I, if, they said, look, you seem to get on with the kids. Great, do you want to do the job? So I did the job for four months, and um, I worked to Greenpeace, doing some work for Greenpeace. I did some paid work for Greenpeace. Mm-hmm. Also, I was much more motivated. So it's I don't know. I just got a great job at Greenpeace, working for one of the guys at Queen Mary College, just doing his filing and doing his, doing his PA work. Okay. And then um, I did that. I had the job doing the um, my, my, the kid thing. Uh, well, so I was doing quite a lot of drumming. I was doing lots of juggling. Is it just on the street or no? Just it, just just my house, just my oh. squat, just practicing a lot, and you okay. know, just learning Sorry. five balls. And um, I had this idea that I couldn't really do street shows until I had five balls, which is stupid. I had a, I had this thing. It's like I, it would be. I'd be a I'd be a fraud to do a street show if I didn't know five ball, if I didn't have a fluent five ball routine. It just felt it was it was essentially was an excuse not to do it because I was scared mm. of doing it unconsciously. I can imagine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I mean that. But my reasoning was I couldn't do it unless I had a decent trick. It would be fraudulent. Mm-hmm. So uh, I learned five balls. You know, that was my aim to learn five balls, and I can go and start doing some street shows. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so I just did that. Came back from Brazil, did that for a few months, and then then I went to France with some mates. Mm-hmm. In the summer and start doing some streets. Okay. And by then I had five balls, so I didn't have any more excuses. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So then I started doing. Te- then I started doing some terror shows. Mm-hmm. When I when I uh, I was playing um, playing some drums in a little band, like just just in a, a folk band. I was just playing some skiffly kind of drums, mm-hmm. and then uh, did that in traveling around doing some busking with those guys, and I started doing little street shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of how it's... Yeah, started, started doing little terror, terror shows, yeah. Okay. And then I basically started really uh, concentrating on learning some more skills. And I, I learned to... I was hitchhiking around France as well a little bit. In between seeing my mates, I'd sometimes hitchhike a little bit. Mm. So when I was hitchhiking, I was practicing unicycle. I used to unicycle... On, I used to hitchhike and unicycle at the same time. Are you serious? You know, yeah, yeah, it was pretty fun. <laughs> and then, yeah, so I, that season, that summer season, I just sort of went around doing bits of street shows in France. Hitchhiking, was it dangerous back then? No. So is it became more dangerous and that's why no one was kind of doing it or what's kind of the... I don't know. I don't know. I stopped doing it just because I, I was, I don't know, because I started making more money. It wasn't <laughs> convenient anymore to do it because it was t- too long, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing, I was hitchhiking till about, th- till about the age of 30, probably. Have you had I mean, any issues? No, I mean, one time it's maybe a bit dodgy. One time this guy drove me into the woods, but I don't know if he was going to do anything or not, but it's... He decided not to when, I don't know if he was, I don't know. He just, I don't know. Maybe he said he needed to take rest. He drove to the woods. We got to this clearing in the woods and there was another car there. So it was like a, a car park. But I was a bit nervous. I was checking out. I was checking with the handle walls, you know, and checking my escape, you know. Yeah. But that's the only issue I ever had in all this year. I was hitchhiking for years. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So by then Scary I was, times. so by then I was mm-hmm. doing little street shows and then, um, 
yeah, the end of that season. Um, yeah, the end of that season, I went to India. Uh, I did some street shows around France. Mm -hmm. And then one of my mates had been to India the year before. So when I'd been in Brazil, mm -hmm. another one of my friends had been in India. One of my best mates had been in India. Mm -hmm. So the next year, the, the end of the end of that summer season in France, doing street shows and stuff, this mate goes, "Oh, what are you doing?" I, I, I didn't know what was going quite because the summer is quite good for in Europe for street shows. Mm -hmm. When it gets to autumn, it usually dries up. You know, mm -hmm. in wherever you are, it just gets a bit dead. You know, the summer's like this. It's a very well, festival kind yeah. of feel. And then in when in September hits, and then kids go back to school and. People got to work and it just suddenly it, it sort of dries up and so it got to September that year and my mate was like, "What do you want to do?" and I was like, oh, "I'm not sure." Uh, and he goes, "Oh, do you want to come to India? We'll do some drama in India. You should come. It'd be right laugh." So I was like, "Yeah, okay." So we got we got a flight <laughs> to India, me and my mate, it's and just, then, and then we travel around India, mm -hmm. uh, went to the mountains, and then when we were in India, we met with other friends. Some other mates came from London as well, mm -hmm. and we ended up traveling with a quite, quite a big group of us. We're traveling around India. Uh, wow. And we were playing a lot of music. I learned tablers, and we we're juggling a lot. We we're traveling around, just, just not really for money. We we're just, just, just playing a lot. But we used to get a lot of stuff. We used to get, we used to get free drinks in bars, and we used to get free. St sometimes we got some free, free accommodation because people would see us playing and say, "How oh, come we stay at ours?" And we'd kind of create a, you know, create a, a vibe, and people come and watch us play. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we're doing that. I did that six months. I was in India. Six months. Yeah, yeah, the whole winter. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I persuaded my mates to to come to go to Japan. I don't think I'll tell you a story. You you, told, you mentioned that you've been to Japan, but you, yeah. You so that trip in India, story. that trip yeah. in India. Uh, there's a, a core group of uh, at this group of friends that we kept meet. We we were, we were sometimes meeting each other. Then we go off, and I do my own thing sometimes, and go off, a, you know, to another town, or mm -hmm. just spend some time on my own, or. I was really into meditation as well, so I'd go off and just be alone for a little bit sometimes. Mm -hmm. I was a bit of a loner sometimes. I want to get away from my mates and to be a bit alone. Uh, and then we'd hook up and we'd meet, you know, we'd, six months, you could do all sorts of stuff. Anyway, there's a core group of four of us, me, uh, Yank, we call it, his nickname was called Yank, uh, uh, Dan and Ian, and there's this core group, four of us. I basically said, look, we should go to Japan. Let's go to Japan. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> You know, it's like, they're like, look, we're going back to France. You know, we're going back to Lorient. Mm -hmm. I was like, are you fucking joking? We've been to Lorient last year and the year before. Are you fucking kidding? Mm -hmm. Why would you go? Why would you want to go to Lorient? We're on the fucking road here. We're in, we're in India. Look at this place. We're, we're in the middle of nowhere. This is fucking amazing. We're on adventure. You want to go to Lorient? Are you kidding? Let's go to Japan. I swear to God, we should go there. We should go to Japan. I swear. I swear we should go. And they're like, you fucking madman. We're not going to Japan. Just shut the fuck up. <laughs> so, uh, so, after about a month of me hassling every day for about a month, they went, all right, fuck it. We're going, okay, we'll go to fucking Japan. Shut the fuck up and we'll go to Japan. Shut the fuck up. We'll go to fucking Japan. You <laughs> idiot. We'll fucking go. Okay, shut up. So I just relentlessly hassled them every day. And then and after a month, we agreed to go. So then we, uh, so at the end of that trip, we, got, we went to Calcutta and then we got a plane to um, Thailand. Mm -hmm. We had to pay back sheesh. We had to pay a bribe to get on the plane. In Calcutta, yeah, it was mad because there was no planes. There's, for some reason, there'd been some sort of curfew or something, or I don't know, whatever. There'd been some reason why they couldn't get planes out. So there's a massive backlog of people trying to get to, to Thailand. I see. It's a huge backlog. And then to get on the head of the backlog, you had to pay a bribe to get on the bloody plane. <laughs> it's madness. So we all had to bribe ourselves onto this plane. Yeah, it's, mad. it's madness, India. So, so we had to pay a bribe to get to even be allowed to buy a ticket. We had to get a bribe. And then, so we got, all got to Bangkok. When we got to Bangkok, for some reason, a backlog there as well. There's no tickets to Japan. For two weeks, there's no tickets, nothing. So I was, again, I wanted, sometimes I want to go, I would like to go away from my mates and get, get away from my mates. Mm -hmm. I like to do these little trips on myself, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I like to do little adventurous things. So I said to my mates, all right, there's no ticket. <laughs> I said, all right, listen, I said, I'm going to meet you in Tokyo. We had, we had one address. We had one address. We went, right. It was, it was a place called Coma Lodge. Mm -hmm. which was near Coma Station, which is on the Yamanote line. That's all we had. Coma Lodge, I think we had an, a street name. Coma Lodge, Coma Station. I think that's all we had. Coma Lodge, Coma Station, Yamanote line. So I said, right, I'm going to meet you there in 14 days' time. <laughs> right? 14 days' time, I'm going to meet you there. Yeah. And then, so you guys can get your tickets to, you get guys get, get your tickets to Tokyo for two weeks' time, and I'm going to meet you there in two weeks. Mm -hmm. On this day, I'll meet you there. Yeah, Coma Lodge. So then I, I got a, I got a plane to Hong Kong, 
it was cheap to get a plane to Hong Kong. It's like 100 bucks. Because also the tickets to Japan were so expensive. It was like 300 bucks or something. It was ridiculously expensive. Yeah. I was shocked. So I got a, a plane to Hong Kong, did a bit of busking in Hong Kong. And then I went up to the Chinese border and got a train up to Shanghai. Yeah, I got a train to Shanghai. And then the idea was to get a boat from Shanghai to, um, to Tokyo uh, or Osaka. And then um, I, I, I'd had it all planned out. Mm -hmm. When I got to Shanghai and there was no fucking boat, the boat was in dry dock. I was like, fuck, and I didn't have much money left. And then so I had a choice of getting a plane, I had to get a plane from Shanghai to, to Japan. And the only plane ticket that I could afford, I could get a plane to, um, to Tokyo or Osaka or, or uh, further back, for, even further away, I think it was, uh, I think it was Hiroshima. The cheapest was Hiroshima. Next, next up was uh, Osaka, and the most expensive was Tokyo. I couldn't really afford a Tokyo flight. It was too expensive. Mm -hmm. So I got a flight to Osaka, and I only had 50 pounds left after that, 50 quid. That's all I had left. And so I got my plane to Osaka and got to Osaka airport and just walked out of the airport and I put my thumb out. <laughs> <laughs> and it hitchhiked to Tokyo. <laughs> Yeah. And some guy would pick me up. It's really sweet. People were so kind and so helpful. This guy picked me up. He said, what are you doing? I was like, I'm trying to get to Tokyo. <laughs> he goes, you speak Japanese? I said, no. He goes, well, you're not going to get there. I said, but I need to get there. I need to meet my friends tomorrow. I, I need to get to meet my mates to get Because, well, look, he goes, look, I, can, I'll, I can drive you to the motorway and, and start the motorway. And I can, I'll make it. So he made me a little sign which said Tokyo in kanji. He wrote the kanji for Tokyo. Tokyo. Yeah. So then he drove me to the, to the, to the start of the motorway. I was literally in the airport. I was in the, on the legend. airport car park. Yeah. <laughs> because you got any money? I said, I got 50 pounds. This that's fucking nothing. I'll get you lunch sort of thing. <laughs> you know. So, wow. so he gave me this tight sign saying Tokyo. And I got a lift. I got a couple, two lifts and they got, they got to Tokyo. I got dropped off at Tokyo in like four in the morning. That's insane. Uh, at Tokyo Station. Yeah. I said, okay, now I can get the m and line. I was in Tokyo Station. So I said, okay, great. I'll get the m and so Actually, the station's not open until half five a.m. I was 4, 4 a.m. So I thought, okay. So I sat outside Tokyo. Uh, I had loads of stuff for me. I had a, a unicycle. I had some tablets. Oh, I had all the stuff, all my juggling equipment. I had loads of shit. And so I sat to outside Tokyo Station with my tablets. And, uh, and at four in the morning, there's loads of like uh, drunken um, salary men, you know, salary men get really pissed and they get so pissed they, they, they forget, they miss the last train. They're, they're staggering around there, staggering around the station waiting, to, waiting for the station to open. And I put my hat down outside Tokyo Station in front of me with plain tablets and they got a few a few thousand in the end i couldn't believe that money was already coming in Shit. i was already making money in in front of the station the station opened at like about half five i got the train to the yamanote line to come at coma station mm -hmm. I, I i said uh, does anybody know coma house and i asked coma house coma house coma house and finally got somebody to, to tell me which way it was coma mm -hmm. house and finally got it there i was there by about 6 30 a.m and my friends were there and they'd arrived the night before and they were sleeping on the sofa there because there's no there's no space in the there's no space there. But the owner had let them sleep on the sofa for the night, just because they got there late that night. I and I met I met them the next morning. So like we were, we were back we were back. That is insane. It was crazy, story crazy. in the That's universe. Crazy, yeah. And you're like 26 at that time. 25, I think. Fuck. I think me. I was 25. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. So I met them just the right, just, it just, it was such a mad event trying to get there for the right time. I managed to get them because if I hadn't arrived there, I'd, I don't know how we would have. Uh, Met each other again because <laughs> we because no we didn't have any contact. You convinced you know. them to go to Japan and like, yeah, guys, in two weeks I'll see you there. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a dick big move! <laughs> yeah, yeah, big dick move. So, uh, so yeah, then, then we hit hit the streets in Japan, and uh, we went to. Um, I just can't believe it, Jesus Christ! You lived in twenty five years. You lived more life than like every single person I know in my entire life. No, literally, not really. It's insane. Yes. Well, it, well, wow. it, it was just different time. It was just, it was different. You weren't, it was, you had more, I don't know, it was a strange, it was a different time. We had more, there was not, you didn't, you know, 9-11 happened, happened. The, the freedoms that we had in those days were huge compared to what you've got now. After 9-11, everything closed down. Mm -hmm. You could travel around on visas, on tourist visas all over the place. As a, as a, as a, as a, a British, hold, British person holding a passport, you didn't need a tourist visa for anywhere, uh, a visa for anywhere. Seriously? You, yeah, you could good. go anywhere with a tourist visa, on entry most places, on entry. There's no security. You could travel anywhere. I mean, it's so free in those days. The freedoms that we had, uh, way beyond anything that you guys have got now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I need to get a visa for Brazil. Uh, yeah, you need to get a visa for India, to be fair. But even so, it was, it was, it was just, it was just, there was a lot less blockage. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot safer as well. There wasn't India now is more dangerous. 
And I even went to Pakistan at that time, and Pakistan wasn't dangerous at that time. How was it safer then than now? Well, Pakistan now has got a lot of Taliban, a lot of it's got a lot of terrorism, it's got kidnappings. You know, there's a it's a dangerous place to be. You know, India, there's a lot less trust there. There's more beatings. There's more crime. Uh, there's more poverty. So now it's a, a, safe, a, a much more dangerous place than it was then. Do you think it was more dangerous back then? No, than no, now? no, 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 definitely not. Definitely really? not. No, 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 absolutely not. No. no. Where did we fuck up in this world? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, all over. <laughs> Wherever you look, that's where we fucked up pretty much. But that was a great trip. So we went to it. So we we uh, we ended up finding another hostel. Mm -hmm. We've Coma Stadium put it on somewhere else, and we found a hostel had just opened, mm -hmm. and we stayed there. They gave us a good deal. And we went out on our first night, and we went to um, Shinjuku, which is a big station in in uh, Shinjuku. Is like one of the big entertainment areas in Tokyo, mm -hmm. and it's where we'd heard you could make money. So we went there, and we found a little pitch, and then uh, we started playing. We were, we were wearing ridiculous clothes from India, these kind of hippie clothes from India. We started playing our tunes and nobody stopped. Yes. Nobody. There was millions of people. I think, I think it's some, I, I can't remember the stats, but it's something like a million people go for Shinjuku Station every day. One million people go to that station. Something insane. And there were just thousands of people walking past us and we were playing our music and everyone was ignoring us. And I'd heard Japan was going to be amazing. I persuaded my friends to travel right around the world to get there. and. And we were going to make our fortune here, and nobody stopped. And not one person stopped, and we just we were just ignored. And we we're like, "Fuck!" For the whole day? No, just for just sort of you know half an hour. What we played for half an hour, twenty minutes. Uh -huh. No, but not a single person stopped. Not a single person gave us anything. Our house was sitting there, and we're like, "Fuck!" And then, um, and then we're like, "Fuck!" So and then, uh, and there was a there was a. There was this vending machine next to the pit, next to where we were standing. Mm -hmm. Right next to us, a vending machine there, which sold haichu, which is a, a sake drink. So I wasn't drinking. My friends just said, "Fuck this, you know. Let's fucking get. Let's just get some haichu, you know." So, so they put some money into this vending machine. Everyone got a can of haichu, and they drank the haichu. And we're like, "Fuck, well, let's." And I said, "Look, we've got to play again. Let's play again. Fuck's sake, we're not just going to walk away. Let's fucking try again." They're like, "There's no point. So let's fucking try again. Let's try again." Mm -hmm. So we we tried again, and this time they were really pissed. They were drunk, so we just started playing. We started dancing around, being stupid. We started following each other around in little circles and just be, doing stupid dances. We just, being really silly, and we got a huge fucking crowd. Are you serious? Unbelievable! All these Sally men stopped. A huge, huge crowd of Sally men because we've been stupid, and they stopped and listened. And they played, and fucking thousand yen start just flying in. Thousand yen notes, which is a fiver, just flying into our, a case. Mm -hmm. Just thousand after thousand after thousand after thousand after thousand after thousand, 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 thousands after thousands, thousands, thousands of yen. It was mental. I couldn't believe. It. We're like fuck, because we just I don't know what we just don't know what, something had happened. What? We got one person stopping it. After one person stopped, everyone stopped, and then we, we just thousands of yen, and we paid for our first month's rent on that first night. We couldn't believe. We just count this money. Like, how much is this? We didn't have any. We didn't have any idea how much this was. We count this money. It was like, well, this is, this is our. our we didn't. We also the hostel had let us, had let us stay. They said, we'll give you the money. They'd let us pay a tiny deposit and to give our give our first month later. Yeah. Because so we're here, we're busking. So we were now. We were made our first month's rent on the first night, easily and more. Shit. And yeah, we're just like, fuck. This is it. We it is it is this is what they said it was. It's the streets of paper gold kind of thing. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And so how long did you spend there in Japan? Um, that trip I spent five weeks in Japan and I did, um, I just did, um, I, I started, I started busking on the way to the pitch. On the way to the pitch, we'll be on trains mm -hmm. and I started doing a little train show in the train, basically begging in the train with, with juggling. But, um, and, but then I started to make more money on the way to the pitch than I was making out the pitch. Really? People liked my little train show. I was just, I just did a little. Oh, you do it yourself? Yeah, right? I was just doing a little juggling show. Yeah, because obviously on the pitch we had to split the money four ways. Okay. So I was doing my train show on the way and just doing some juggling and going, hubba, 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 hey, hubba, hey, hubba, hey, hubba. I got my hat, hubba, 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 hubba. Just didn't speak Japanese, just, just doing silly clowning, you know, hubba, hubba, and juggling balls, juggling clubs, juggling five balls, my five balls, you know. So uh. juggling five balls. And, and, then, and then people would, I'd be on a train and then people would just give me money. And I was just like, fuck, this is mad. I'm making money on the train on the way to the pitch. And then very quickly I, start, I realized I was making more money from the trains. Then I was making with the group, and anyway, the group was happy for me not to be with them because they were making more money. If we all started working solo shows or double shows rather than four four people because the money would double. Mm 
Makes sense. And we get the same money anyway. If you do it, play a, a duo, you make the same money mm -hmm. as you would with four people. Mm -hmm. So we all start splitting up anyway. Mm -hmm. So they said, yeah, do your train show, that's fine. So I just did my train show and meet up with my mates at night, you know. And I just start making, I wasn't making huge money. I make like a hundred pound a day. I go out and bust two or three hours. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd always make 24,000 yen, which was then, which in those days was a hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. I said, right, I'm not going to go home until I've got 24,000 yen. Mm -hmm. so, and then sometimes I just make 24,000 yen quickly and then I get to 30,000 yen. You know, I just, sometimes yeah, I get yeah. more. And then, um, so I was busting every day and I'd make a thousand pound a week, basically. Yeah. Not bad. And after five weeks, I had 5,000 pounds saved up. Shit. And I was like, yeah, I was like, shit. That was good money back then as well. Yeah. Jesus I was like, money. fucking shit. I was like, fucking shit. Yeah. Fucking shit. I've just been in bloody India. And in India, I'd just been in India for six months and I spent 600 pounds in six months. What? Yeah, yeah, because it's very cheap in India. It's, it's white privilege. Fine. It's a white privilege thing again because the, the pound is strong and the, mm -hmm. the rupee is low. You could get hotels and trains, cheap hotels and cheap. You can live cheap out yeah, there. Not, not living in five star hotels, living in very, very cheap hotels. But you can live for a hundred pound a month. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I'd been in India for six months, spent 600 pounds. I've been in, in Japan for five weeks and saved 5,000 pounds. I was like, whoa. I was like, whoa, fuck, this is it. I'm now. Mr. Fucking Traveller Freedom Boy, you know, <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> title of the show. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, right, fucking hell. So then I thought, okay, well, look, I'm like, so I said to my mates, look, they were having a great time. We were, we were having a good time in Japan. Everyone was having a good time. Um, apart from Dan, didn't really like it. Um, but we were having a good time in Japan. So I, let, I said, look, mates, that was wicked. But I said, I want to do some more traveling on my own again. So I'm, I said, I'm going to, um, let's meet, I'll meet you back in Europe. So I went, I got a train through China. I loved traveling. I loved fucking traveling and going on the road and being adventurous. So I got a boat, I hitchhiked back down to Kobe, got a boat back to Shanghai, got a train to Beijing, and I got the Trans Siberian to Moscow. And then, yeah, yeah. I, so I, got, I got a Trans Siberian train. Yeah. I remember I got a ticket for 90 pounds. It was incredible. Yes. Yeah, from, from, from China basically to Moscow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. It was even, even a first class berth as well. I didn't share with one person. Uh, I was really lucky. Mm -hmm. And then I got to Russia. I met, lucky I met a couple of Russian boys in, in, in Moscow who spoke English and I hung out with them for a bit. It was amazing. It was a really good trip. And then I went to Berlin and then my mates had some squats in Berlin. I squatted in Berlin for a bit more. I had a really good friend in Berlin who put me up in their squat. I lived there for about a month doing bits of street shows mm -hmm. and bits of train shows. And then I went back to Europe and then I met my mates back in, in France again mm -hmm. that summer. Oh, it's an amazing trip. It's great. And the following winter I went back to India. And the following spring, uh, India and Pakistan. And the following spring, I went. I went uh, then I went through Tibet. Mm -hmm. I, I got from India up into Tibet, trained back to Shanghai. I got a boat back to Kyoto, and I did another season in Japan the following spring. Uh, another, another. I did a three months spring, three months season this time. Started how much, how much did you make? Uh, I don't remember how much I made, but I remember making a lot more. I started doing my street shows. I started doing my um, train show, mm -hmm. and then. Somebody said to me, oh, you should go and check out the cherry blossom. And so I went to, have you heard about cherry blossom? Japan? Yeah. What, it's what a cultural else? phenomenon. It's when, when in the spring, uh, the cherries come into, into, mm -hmm. into blossom and, and Japanese people all picnic under the, under the blossom. Oh, they picnic there. Everyone has picnics. It's kind of, you, you have to have a picnic in cherry blossom. It's one of the, one of the things. So if you're a student, you're going to be student buddies. If you're a businessman, you go with your business book colleagues. If you're a housewife, you go with your house, housewife friends, and everyone will have a, a picnic at least once mm -hmm. in Cherry Blossom season. So the parks are filled filled with people, filled absolutely stuffed, and then um, and then the yakuza also also have stalls in all the parks. They have uh, stalls selling food. It's like a it's a big festival. Every Cherry Blossom park will have a, a like a, almost a. It's, it's not a festival, it's like a festival. Mm -hmm. so you, have, you, have, you have street food, street vending, you have everyone puts their, their mats down, and then you have a cherry blossom picnic. Everyone in Japan will have a cherry blossom picnic in, in, that, in that 10 days of cherry blossom mm -hmm. in the season. And so the parks are filled with people. So I was doing train shows, and then so we said, you should go, go to Maidayama Cohen and do, a, sh do your thing up there. So I said, oh, what's this? So I went up to Maida Kam and started doing little, little shows to the picnics. Because, you know, I was used to walking up to terraces in France. Mm -hmm. So I used to walk up to the picnics in Japan. Because <laughs> you can't really go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, uh, I'm going to do a show for you. I do a little show and I juggle some fire and eat the fire and do my unicycle and juggle some fire. And they're like, hey, give me some money. You know, it's mad. And I remember on the first night I went to this park 
I made like 300 quid for two, for two or three hours. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I was like, fuck, I'm going there again tomorrow. And the next night I went there, I made another 300 quid. And the next night I went again, made 400 pounds. The next night I went 500 pounds. I was, I was making decent money. I was like, fuck. Insane money, I'm Insane. Saying. I was like, fuck, what's this going on? This is crazy. And then uh, I was like, fucking hell, this is mental. And I was, and then, because uh, every night was different picnics. It was new audience every night. And, <laughs> and, and every picnic hat was a new audience. So you, you'd do a show there and you'd, you'd go around the whole bloody park just doing different picnics and people would call you over. Oh, serious? come, come, get getting drunk. And come, come, come. And they call you over to do a show for them. And yeah, hey guys. <laughs> you know? Was there a competition that you have to compete No, it was just people? me. Just me in the park. What? And then, so yeah. So that was Mario McCohen. Uh, and then, so that, and then, then I, I did that for a few nights. And then the cherry blossom season ended. I was like, oh shit, that's yeah, it. It's done. I was like, I thought, I was on cloud nine. I was like, fuck, it's, I'm going to be a millionaire. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, and every then, day for a year or two. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then the cherry blossom finished and it all falls off the trees. And that's it. The park is dead. And then, um, and some guy in the park said, oh, you should go to Dotonbury in Osaka. So, um, so I went to Dotonbury in Osaka after the cherry blossom finished. And Dotonbury has this bridge called Dotonbury Bridge. Mm -hmm. Dotonbury Hashi in Japanese. And it's this mad fucking bridge. It's like an entertainment area. It's this, it's like a mall, but then there's this bridge and everyone has to go to the bridge. It's a very famous bridge culturally, mm -hmm. to Tommy Bridge, where everyone has to go and get a photo there mm -hmm. on the bridge. It's before selfies, but it's, everyone used to have photos on the bridge. I don't got no idea why, but everyone used to be on this bridge. And there'd, there'd be uh, this, this big um, advert there that was from the 40s or 50s in it, a neon advert on, the, on one of the buildings, which is iconic. And they'd have the photos in front of this advert. Mm -hmm. some, some guy running in front of a milk product. And, um, it was this thing, it was like a thing where everyone had to go, there thousands of people there. And so I started doing my street shows there, my little street show. I mean, I didn't really have, a, had the basic, most basic street show ever. And I remember one night I was just, just learning, it was the first second night, and then this guy came by, an Australian guy. And, um, oh God, what's his name? He's an Australian street former. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot his name, that's really bad of me. He's called Butch, that's it, Butch, <laughs> Butch. And he goes, oh, you should get the people to clap. And that's how you get a, get a crowd together. So he taught me to do a clap and cheer. Mm -hmm. So he, he taught me a few little phrases and then he taught me the basic thing, the, one of the most basic things of a street show is gathering a crowd and this getting your crowd to clap and cheer. Mm -hmm. And so once you get into clap and cheer for no reason at all, then more people come. So he taught, taught me how to gather a crowd, this guy called Butch. So then I, once I learned that bit, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to go to, up to a picnic anymore. Because then I had my crowd build. Do you know what I mean? A basic yeah. crowd build. And this place was so fucking busy. So busy that you had a little basic crowd build. And that was it. You, you could just do your show then. Mm -hmm. And then I just had like a five, ten minute show, ten minute show. And I made like a bit of money from a five, ten minute show, ten minute show. Finishing on a, a unicycle juggle and a fire, eating a fire club. And then I'd make like four or five thousand yen, which is like 20 or 30 quid. For like ten, 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 For ten minutes. minutes. Yeah. And I could do that. I could knock out six days an hour. So then I'd be on like, Whoa. you know, then I could make money. I could make like 108 pound an hour sort of thing. More. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I used to make a thousand quid a day under Tombury. Wow. I used to go on a Saturday and make a thousand quid, Sunday make a thousand quid. And then in the week I used to go there and just do some street shows in the night, in the night time, mm -hmm. you know, make a few hundred quid. So by the end of the week I had, you know, I might have 3000 pounds by the end of the week. Or something like this. I don't know what the numbers, I can't remember. I saw I went a diary somewhere, but. But it was madness. It was madness. That was my uh, second time in Japan. Wow. I was like, okay, I, 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 this is it. Are you still not even 30 yet? It's like still 27, probably 26. Yeah, I was about 27, yeah. It's about that. So like, what do you do with Oh, yeah, 27. Your... No, that's 26 that year, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it was 27 that year, maybe. I can remember because I had it in my mind that by, by the age of 27, I should know what I'm doing. Did yeah, my friend, my friend had said, oh, yeah. Because when I was 23, I had a real hard time in my head. I was really having a hard time. Mm -hmm. 23 is a hard age, I think. And I really didn't know what I was doing. And I was really lost. And I felt really depressed mm -hmm. before I went to Brazil. I was feeling really depressed and really confused. And I was really upset. And I didn't know whether I should go try and get a job and, you know, be serious in my life or carry on juggling or mm -hmm. try and pursue my music or try and be a child carer. I didn't know what I was doing. I was so lost. And I felt so depressed and upset. And I, I was, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I was so in a state that I went, I was at a party and I was, I couldn't even, I was also having a panic attack because I couldn't, I couldn't decide what I was doing in my life. And I, I, I was trying to be in this party, but I couldn't really talk to people. I was so, uh, 
confused. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, this might have been, before, I don't know if it was before or after Brazil, but it might, I don't remember. But I remember I left the party and I was just, I just had to get out of this party. I was it? I was in London Bridge, I just went under an arch and started juggling my five balls because I just had to get out of my head, you know, I just had to not be... It must have been after Brazil because I was sober. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so I was just under this bridge, just juggling, just trying to not think, just not to, not just to get out of my head because I was so, having such an awful time in my head, you know. Mm-hmm. Just juggling, trying to just relax. And then a friend of mine came out of the party called Melissa. She was, what are you doing? And I told her about my, about my um, you know, my conflict and my why well, I was so depressed and I couldn't work out what to do in my life and what should I do and how do you make these decisions anyway and what you know it's all too much for me you know to, to bear I couldn't handle it I, mm-hmm. I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to decide what to do I was really not in a good way and then and then she just went how old are you I was like oh, I'm 20 24 23 24 I think I was 24 24 and she goes you're 24 you don't have to worry about that shit <laughs> <laughs> I said really I said no because me and me and Agent, her boyfriend's called Agent. Because me and Agent, we didn't know what we were doing until we were twenty-seven. I said, "Really? Yeah, you don't have to worry. You're Twenty-four, fuck's sake. You don't. You know, when you're twenty-seven, you'll know what you want to do." So I said, "Really? Oh my god, that's brilliant! Really? Oh, that's amazing!" And I was so happy. I'm back to the party. I was dancing. I was partying. I said, "It's great. I don't have to worry until I'm twenty-seven." And when I was twenty-seven, I was on the Tommy Bridge doing these street shows. Mm-hmm. And then my, this guy taught me a club in Chia. Oh no, that's the following season. That's right. Sorry, it's the following season. That was so. Yeah, so the guy that was in the spring. In mm-hmm. the spring, I learned my club in Chia. And I went when I went back to Europe and did some more stuffs in Europe, some more streets in Europe. And in the autumn, I went back to Japan. Mm-hmm. And in the autumn, I kept, became twenty-seven. That's mm-hmm. it. In the autumn, I went back to Japan. And then in the autumn, I came twenty-seven. I remember that I was on the Tomi Bridge. Uh, this guy had also. I met another. There's another performer there, another street performer there on the Tomi Bridge. Mm-hmm. I met another guy, an English guy. Uh, who was also doing street shows, and it, and he t- he taught me this routine with a Diablo, throwing a Diablo in the air and catching it to get the oh. crowd going. It's such a simple trick, throw it in the air and catch it and get the crowd going. And he taught me this routine, and that's my that's when I turned twenty seven. I was like, I have my club of cheer, I have my Diablo routine, I have my fire routine, I'm juggling on the unicycle, I have my swallowing, I had a fucking street show, like fifteen minute street show. And I was like, oh, I'm twenty seven. Yeah, she was right. <laughs> No, 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 I am, sort of thing. Wow. Yeah, no, no. I'm a street performer. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. And I was making great money and I was, felt really good and mm-hmm. I was really happy and I was doing loads of great, I was just feeling really clowny and stupid. And I could re- had a great little street show. It was lovely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so basically, from 23 onwards, you, you've been doing just whatever felt like you were, wanted to do. Yeah. You didn't have like a plan. Once, on like yeah, once, once Melissa said, I didn't have to worry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she gave me the confidence to not worry about it and just went and did my thing, you know. And it's great. The street show is brilliant. It was so anarchic. I had my fire torches. I'd light my fire torches. I'd get a guy. I'd, that's right. I'd, it was a, such a great bit of the show. I loved it. I'd, I'd get some guy on the unis. I get some guy to help me onto the unicycle. It was only a low unicycle. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I get I get my arm around this guy, and I'd fall off. Uni- I'd be. Around, I'd, be a, I'd get him to help me on. And once I was on, I'd go around him on the unicycle. It was really clowny, and he's like trying to help me. It was completely shit. It was <laughs> obvious I couldn't do the unicycle. I, was, <laughs> I couldn't fucking do it. I was all over the place. I'd hang on to him, and I'd say, "Okay," and then and then he'd hold me up, and I get the, and I get the fire torches lit. And then I just go, whoa, and go straight for the crowd. <laughs> I just cycle straight towards the crowd with the fire torches lit. It was brilliant. You know, I was, I was, I was in control, but it just yeah, looked, like, it looked like I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And the crowd screamed. They used to run, run out of the way. They used to run out of the way. They used to run out of the way. It was a great show. I loved it. Brilliant. And they used to run out of the way, and I used to cycle around outside of the crowd and cycle back through the hole that I'd left in the crowd <laughs> and get back to the beginning and then just sort of then, then wobble around and they go and they go yeah he's, he can actually stay still <laughs> and he used to juggle on the on the little unicycle to finish it was a fucking great little show it was it wasn't very verbal because i didn't know much japanese mm-hmm. i just learned lines my night, night by night i learned lines on my arm mm-hmm. but it was really visual and and the fact that and the, the fact that going through the crowd with fire was great because it just it created this whole sense of an anarchy you know mm-hmm. and uh, I'd learned that trick from Ber- from Berlin a year before when I was in Berlin there was a, a group there there was a there's two groups there was a there was, um, uh, there was a group called was it two, 2000 there was a group there's a group 
they're all anarchists and punks. And there was a group uh, that made sculptures, another mm -hmm. group that did sort of these big, big fire shows with fireworks and pyrotechnics. Yeah. I forget the name of it now, but they had these huge shows in Berlin, massive, like thousands of people used to go to these shows, public, little public shows. So it was, you, you don't have to get a ticket in these huge squares. Mm -hmm. And they had these cars and trucks and they all, they were made into dragons and made into these huge shapes and they were, they, they'd have cranes on them and it was really visual and it'd have fire breathing dragons. And they also, but also they, they, they drove through the crowd with fire spurting out. It was really, it was amazing that nobody got hurt. It was amazing shows. It was so exhilarating because you'd be fucking running for your life, you know, <laughs> as uh, you'd run for your fucking life. And it was so great. so much fun and it spurt fire out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's when I picked up that little trick. I did it in a much smaller version in my street show. Okay. But it was such a great trick to, to basically, to create the, the, uh, the, the, the perception that anything could happen, you know, mm -hmm. that you could be, you know, somebody could get hurt. It was a great, it's a great trick for streets. Wow. It's not, it's, you can never get away with that now, I don't think. Oh, I don't think so. But, yeah. but <laughs> it, it was, nobody ever got hurt. The thing is, nobody ever got hurt. It was a great move and people loved it. People were killing themselves. People absolutely, people were loving it, you know? It was, it was such a great little, little, uh, little show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so awesome. Yeah, it was really, <laughs> it was really fun. And then, uh, and then I went, the, the following season, that was the season, that, that was it, that was autumn. Mm -hmm. I worked in Japan. And then, um, oh God, this is, this, is this is such a great season. And then I fell in love with Melissa, the same girl who told me at 23 that I should travel, happened to be living in, in Kyoto. Okay. She happened to live in Kyoto. So I, I sort of stayed with her mm -hmm. in Kyoto. I was, I was very insecure. I was a very insecure man. I, didn't, I hadn't had a girlfriend for years. I was really sexually insecure. Uh, uh, I was really, really insecure about, about sex and all sorts of stuff. I was really not, not in a good way wow. with women. But I really liked Melissa. I thought she was amazing. And I used to, she was, we were both sort of lonely spirits. She used to practice her thing in the house. And I used to practice outside juggling. Anyway, I sort of fell in love with her. And eventually, I'm, we, we tried to get it on. I got to try to get on with it, but I was so nervous. I couldn't really, I, I woke up in bed with her. She goes, okay, let's fucking do it, fuck it. And I woke up in bed with her. I couldn't, I couldn't have sex. I was too nervous to have sex with her. Wow. So I kissed her a bit. I said, oh, uh, and then she went to England for a month and came back. And when she came back, I was waiting for her to come back in her house like a dickhead. <laughs> And she's like, what are you doing here? I was like, oh, I thought I'd wait for you. <laughs> and then she's like, Mark, sorry, I fell in love with somebody in London. You know, I'm not, if I forget it. And, um, and she, goes, she goes, anyway, you don't want to stay here anyway. You want to live in Japan for the winter? You know, I was trying to do street shows still. It was December. Mm -hmm. I was wearing um, mittens with the fingers cut off so I could hold the clubs. It was freezing. It was really hard. Mm -hmm. I was still doing shows. I was still making a bit of money, but it was... It was not even winter yet. It was approaching, it was December, so it was still going to get worse. Okay. And then she goes, oh, why would you want to stay in Japan? You can, you know, you're a free bird. You're a fucking free spirit. I was like, yeah, you're right. I am. <laughs> and I just, that wasn't, it was funny thing. So I was like, yeah, you're right. I am. So I, I said, yeah, I'm going to go tomorrow. So I quickly just jumped out of this stupid state of mind I got into. Mm -hmm. And I went traveling. I went down south. I went to south of Japan doing street shows. I went down to um, um, Kyushu, is it? Anyway, I can't remember the name of that, that section of Japan. I went, I went out to Hiroshima and then out to um, Kumamoto, down, down to down to the south of Japan. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was doing street shows the whole time. It was amazing because as you went south, it got warmer. Got warmer. <laughs> and then I got a boat to um, Okinawa, mm -hmm. which is the southern island of Japan. And I did street shows there. It's where the, the military, the, the US would basically have that as a military base, huge military base on Okinawa. And then from there, I went to a tiny little island called Iremote, which was even further south, it wasn't, you can't really do street shows there, it was too sparse. I did one street show in a flea market one day and lived with some hippies. And then I got a boat from Erimote to Taiwan and I lived for the whole winter in Taiwan for like six weeks or uh, six weeks in, in Taiwan. It was fucking amazing. I did street shows in Taiwan in Chinese, well, in very pidgin type Chinese. It was incredible in a city called Kaohsiung. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to Hong Kong for a little bit to, to renew my visa for Taiwan came back and then when the spring came around, I, I came back up, up north and worked, went in reverse. When the spring came, worked in reverse and came up to Komodo and went back up to, back up to Kyoto. So I was doing a whole, I did a whole winter of, of traveling around Asia and doing mm -hmm. little street shows, little, these little street shows. It was, it was amazing. It was, it was amazing. It was, it was completely incredible. And Taiwan was so, Taiwan was so, um, 
well, it's warm. The weather was warm as well, and it's, and the people are so generous and so giving. They had so much money on their cash. I mean, it wasn't as good as Japan, but they had so much. Just, it was such so warm there, and there was like lots of street food mm -hmm. and lots of street markets, and it was kind of like India, but I had kind of like Japan. It's kind of cross between Japan and India. It was incredible. I felt so I felt so in love with Taiwan, mm -hmm. and then when I left, I, I started crying. I was so upset to leave. Oh, wow. <laughs> I cried for like three hours. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yeah. So where did you go then? Okay. I went back at Chiman, got the boat back up to um mm -hmm. up to uh I got the boat back up to uh, up to the island, what was it uh to um uh Okinawa. Got a boat from Taiwan up to Okinawa and then a boat back up to Kimoto and I went back up to, up back, mm -hmm. up into back into the cold and back into because Japan's very cold as well socially. Mm -hmm. Uh Taiwan was really warm socially. People mm -hmm. were just so warm there, they've always just so wanted to be friends and and Japan's sort of much more sort of standoffish and much more lonely. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so with all this traveling that you did, you didn't stay too long over time in each place. Uh, do you have any relationships with no, women? No, or? I was very lonely. I was very lonely as far as those kind of relationships go. No, I wasn't. I was too insecure to go out with girls. Really? Oh yeah, I was, I was too insecure. I didn't really, I wasn't, I was, I was sexually very insecure as well. So all the time you've been by yourself, basically. Yeah, I was supposed to, yeah, I was by myself pretty much all that time. Yeah, wasn't but then, huh? Wasn't that lonely? Yeah, I was lonely. Yeah, very lonely. But I, I was lonely. Yeah, but you know, but I kind of, um, I don't know. I sort of, um, I don't know. I, I, I was on a bit of a trip because I was into being a monk. <laughs> I was sort of on this ego trip about being a monk and med I was doing a lot of meditation and mm -hmm. I was just terrified of women essentially <laughs> I was basically there. <laughs> very scared of women but I'd made it into this whole ego trip that I was you know I was pure and I was <laughs> I was a monk and I was making I was taking my sexual energy and making it to a higher center and I was bullshit I can do six balls or five yeah, 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 balls yeah, yeah, I'm I'm yeah, yeah. balls instead you know <laughs> but, uh, but then actually in Taiwan that season I started doing these uh, tantra tantric uh, meditations mm -hmm. Um, I got this book about I've got this book uh, about tantric sex, tantric meditations, and then I started kind of doing all these meditations in, in Taiwan actually, mm -hmm. which you know, it's a bit embarrassing. But you end up you got you got a wank off, you got a jack off, and then you take you, then you meditate and take that sexual energy and suck it up your spine into your into your center. And if you do these if you do these exercises, you actually you can actually sort of take that sexual energy you actually you, you and you and your you you your heart and goes down you suck up sexual energy up your spine and your heart and goes down and then you can then you can sort of then you can come back again and bring it back up again so you learn to sort of direct that sexual energy that is so cool yeah yeah i, I didn't know if it worked or not but i did all these exercises and then and then i thought right I got to go and test them out. I got, you know, I got. I kind of became aware of the fact that I was full of shit, you know. <laughs> that I was just scared of women, you know. So I thought, okay, you got to challenge this fear, you know. This is bullshit. You can't mm -hmm. go, go the rest of your life being scared of women. That's bullshit. So I, I sort of learned these tantric exercises, and then, and then, um, and then I, uh, uh, and then the next season. So that was, hang on, what you? So where was that? So I went back to in the spring. Oh yeah, so I went back to Japan in the spring, and then in the in the summer I went back to Europe again. I think. Oh, fuck, I, went, I think I went to America a bit. No, 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 no. Fuck, I'm... Um, what did I go? Went, went to spring, back to Japan. Yeah, I did Kyoto again. Did the Kyoto, I did a street show, probably street show, and did Kyoto, that park again, that spring. And in the summer, that summer, I think I came back to the UK. And then the autumn, went back to Japan, doing more street shows in the autumn mm -hmm. on my Dotombri Bridge uh, pitch. And then in the winter, I thought, right, you got to challenge yourself. You're doing. You got this great thing going on in Japan. My street show was going up and up and up in Japan. I was, you know, I saved up a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. By that point, I remember I had eighty thousand dollars in the bank. Fuck. You know, and um, and I thought, right, you've got a street show in Japan. It works. There's no doubt about that. You know, you've got a good character in Japan. Everything works. That's great. You can go back to Japan for the rest of your life. But you're not doing shows in English. You got to challenge yourself. You got to face your fears and challenge yourself. So, so that winter, instead of like the previous winter, I'd gone to Taiwan. Which I loved, but I thought you got to challenge. I said, and I said, right, go to Australia. So I went to Australia to try and learn doing street shows in English, mm. and then um, and I died on my ass, completely died. Are you serious? Oh god, it's awful. Yeah, it's terrible. It's awful, awful, awful. I had a great show in Japan, but I, I, I had a great character. I spoke Japanese. I spoke my lines. I knew, you know, I was really animated. But when it came to speaking English in public, I, I was just, I was just, you know, I just, I just, uh, I was just, uh, I, was, I was like a. 
a shell, you know, a shell of myself, you know. What? Yeah, yeah, because I hadn't ever learned to speak in English, and it was and uh, yeah. when you speak a foreign language, you can be a lot more. It was like a character. You really aren't like yourself. You, you're yeah. not really yourself. You're a clown, mm -hmm. and you're not really. You can really be more expressive and stupid because you're already a clown because you're speaking pigeon language anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. People laugh at you because the way you say hello. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, if you, you get a Chinese person going, hello, you know, it's already ridiculous and funny. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Same in Japanese, either way around, you know. I go, konnichiwa, they just fucking go, ha, ah, this fucking <laughs> idiot, <laughs> idiot. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's that. So you get a lot from being a foreigner, being yeah, a fucking yeah. idiot, you know, in a foreign country. It's like maybe a racist stereotype, you know, of an English person. Do you know what I mean? They love that. And you play up to it. You play up to it, and then you're, you're immediately in, in this clowny thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So when it came to doing it in English, I didn't have, know how to do it. And, uh, and I remember I, got, I, got, and I had a rule, because I had all this money in the bank. But I went to Australia, I was like, right, you're not allowed to fucking live off that money. You're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. You were not allowed to touch it. You've got to live on the money you make on, the, on your street show. And uh, you can't start cheating. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you cheat, you won't fucking do the street shows. Yeah. Because you'll then just fucking have a good time and spending, you know, some of your cash, mm -hmm. some of your savings. Mm -hmm. So I made that dogma in my head that I had to live off the streets completely. And it was so hard. <laughs> it was so hard. It was so hard. It was so hard. It was so fucking hard. You can't imagine how hard it was. And then people weren't interested. And I, I didn't have a street show. I couldn't communicate properly. But also, there's more of a street show that seen there. There's a whole, uh, there's a whole sort of group of street performers there who didn't really know me very well. They didn't know me at all. All I was, well, I was just some fucking piece of shit turned up who didn't have a street show, was taking their shows away, mm -hmm. was taking up time on the pitch, you know, was taking away their opportunity to use the pitch, didn't have a proper street show, was a piece of fucking shit, didn't know what he was fucking doing, mm -hmm. you know, was living like a fucking pauper because he didn't have any money. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I didn't tell that, I didn't tell my, 80, I didn't tell my $80,000 in the bank. I was fucking, I was living off my fucking street shows. Yeah. So that I was, so I was really, lowest of the low status there and all, and i knew i knew like a couple of people i only knew like one or two people mm -hmm. in that scene from i knew one guy called aj who i knew from i bumped into into in france years before so i didn't really know anybody and i felt really lonely and i was really shit mm -hmm. <laughs> like i was making pittance and i was I, I used to cry myself to sleep every night i used to go to bed and just cry <laughs> Yeah, well, coming from Japan, where you make like five yeah. grand in a, in a yeah, night, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, I was a king. <laughs> and wow. then, so it's really good for me because I learned slowly how to fucking. I learned. I got my voice eventually. Mm -hmm. to, eventually, I did learn okay. how to do street shows. But it took me a whole season. And by the end of the season, I, I had a really shit street show. By the end of the season, by like three or four months after, I still had a very, very basic street mm -hmm. show in English. Uh, I also I met a girl girl there as well. I met a girl there called Alex and. Uh, we start seeing each other and my tantric sex kind of worked. I, I, I was, I, yeah, so awesome. that was good. I fell in love with her. I fell madly in love with this woman, madly in love. I didn't have anything else either. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> and then she was a clarinetist. And then we went, we ended up, I ended up saying, I mean, she had a boyfriend. She had a sort of a fiance in England as well as girl. But uh, he, were... yeah, so we started seeing each other, but it was kind of quite loose because she didn't know where she was going to go back and see a fiance. Uh, and so we went to Japan in the end. I, I went to Japan, I said, look, come to Japan, I'm sure you can make money there, doing your clarinet. So she came over and stayed with me in Japan, subsequently, I met wow. up with her. And she was doing good money, she did okay money playing a clarinet. She was very pretty, she mm. played clarinet in the, in the stations, and she was making great money. Uh, yeah, and I was doing my street shows, and then, so I had a girlfriend then for a bit. Yeah, and she went back to see her fiancé. Uh, <laughs> but, no, but then, her fiancé well, didn't work out, so she could come out and start seeing me. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Awesome, yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I had a girl. I had a girl. We were together like three and a half years, traveling around doing street shows. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Right, and that—that that was you around thirty. Well, it was. It was. It was kind of cool. I mean, it was a bit mm -hmm. annoying because uh, her. She was playing clarinet, so she'd do. She'd do walk by. Right. She was doing walk by before. You know what the difference is? If you if you do it. Uh, uh, if you're working in the streets, you can do you can do something where people are walking by and giving you money as they pass by, mm -hmm. or you can do something where you get a crowd and build a crowd and build a crowd and build a crowd and work towards a finale. Yeah. So you you build it up into something and then finish on a big high and get mm -hmm. money get everyone to pay at the end. So that's a very different. Those two things are two different genres mm -hmm. in terms of street performance. Right. Once once kind of called busking, where you're doing walk by 
walk by stuff and the other is like I, you call it street performing where you're actually trying to perform and, yeah. and build this thing you up build the performance yeah build, build up yeah. and it's more about the performance you know I mean you get some great people who perform brilliantly doing walk by amazing talented people you know not, mm -hmm. I don't want to put it down um, but it meant it meant that actually charming together was a bit hard because it it lends itself to very different pictures. Like I wanted to play Common Garden or, or Lesser Square, but she needs someone much, much more quiet. She, she could make great money on in in a street in in rural France, <laughs> you know, in a street full of tourists, yeah. looking beautiful and playing amazing, amazing, skillful clarinet in a quiet street in a back street. She couldn't make a penny in Covent Garden because it's too noisy and too crazy, and yeah. she'd be ignored, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, it wasn't easy, for, so easy for us to travel together because. If you know, we tried. We went to France, and I couldn't. I couldn't do my street show because there's no space to do a street show in a rural little yeah, right, market yeah. town, you know. But she'd make fucking loads of money in, in, that, in that environment. And we go to Paris, and I do great money in Paris, but she couldn't find anywhere to work because it's too crazy. So you know what I mean? So we, it, it, it sounds so weird. Yeah, it sounded yeah. good. It sounded like idyllic, but it wasn't because we couldn't work. It was hard for us to work together. Yeah. So in the end, she. I just. We had a little van. I said, yeah, I get, you have the van. I go back to London. You go and do your little market towns. I'll go and do Common Garden for a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it wasn't easy for us to work in the same place generally, mm -hmm. except in Japan. It's good in Japan because I could do my big pictures and she could go to a quiet temple somewhere. And kind of work there. Yeah, well, you know, there's some places we can make it work a little mm -hmm. bit, you know. She'd find a pitch in some towns where she could work. It was hard in London mm -hmm. to find that quiet, to find that. You know that tranquil place, which could make a, a solo clarinetist mm -hmm. an amplified feel magical. You know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Okay, and so we're looking at uh, you kind of with that with Alex for about three years. With, uh, we're coming closer to you being thirty now, mm -hmm. and uh, that's ten years basically before you thought about opening a comedy club. Area. Fourteen years. Fourteen years. Fourteen. Years Fifteen before. years, really. Yeah. So. No, I thought it's uh, yeah, thirteen years. What has been happening in that? So, years? um, so then about thirty, my mum died when I was thirty, oh. and we had to come back from Japan in the middle of a season. Mm -hmm. It was an autumn season. My mum died, and um, and then um, I came back for the autumn. I had to look after my stepfather for a bit, mm -hmm. and then um, we went back to Japan for the winter. She went to uh, uh, uh then. She, Alex went to India for 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 the winter because she'd never done India and I had. I didn't want to go to fucking India because I'd already been to India. So this is, you know, we we're on a bit of a different track. You know, she wanted to go to India, so she went to India, mm -hmm. and I went to Australia for a season doing Australia. My street show's got to get better in Australia, <laughs> and then uh, yeah, uh, it's slowly getting better. It was still pretty shit street show in English, but it was much better. In, in, my Japanese show was always ahead of my English show at that point. Mm -hmm. My Japanese show was amazing. My English show was shit. So. Um, so then she went to she went to uh, uh, India mm -hmm. for the winter, and I went to Australia for the winter. She started shagging this, uh, uh, this Italian guy, and she's like traveling with this Italian guy. I got really upset about it, uh, and then um, yeah, but I got her back. I went to Adelaide, and, and Adelaide's got a weird proportion of women to men, and I think it's got like loads of women compared to men. And I, I, yeah, women used to hit on me, and not, I never had it before. So yeah, where is that again? Yeah, Adelaide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Adelaide. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> so yeah, I was, yeah. So anyway, yeah, we both had had separate sexual things going on a little mm -hmm. bit, but then we met up again in Bangkok and made up, and you know, start seeing each other again. Mm -hmm. We always were seeing each other weirdly. Anyway, uh, so then that was took me through till about I don't know a couple more. I did another season in Japan. Did another season in Europe, mm -hmm. and at some point, I think that following winter, we stayed in London. Mm. Um, it was actually Alex. She said, "Listen, Mark. She, I, I mean, I was I was a bit of an idiot, right? She's like, listen, Mark, you got this money saved up here. Yeah? What do you want to do with the money?' I was like, I, "I don't know, really." She goes, "Well, don't you think you should maybe do with it? Do something with it? Because it's just sitting there doing nothing. Don't you think you should do with something? Isn't it? Is there nothing that you might?" Is there something you might want to get with it? If anything, have you ever thought about doing something that you want to do? And I was like, oh, well, I've kind of always wanted a building in London. Yeah, I've always wanted a building because ever since I was squatting, it's nice to have a, bu nice to have a building because mm -hmm. why don't we, <laughs> she's like, why don't we spend it? Instead of going back to Australia again in the winter season, why don't we just stay in London and try and find a building for you to buy? I was like, yeah, okay, then let's do that then. You know? <laughs> so I did. So I did Covent Garden that winter, mm 
<laughs> which is which is a really good thing to do actually. Doing common garden in the winter is a hard season to do, but it makes you stronger. It makes your show stronger because it, it it it's harder to hold a, a crowd in the winter. So you know adversity kind of breeds this strength, you know, mm -hmm. in your performance and in your, in your ability to hold a crowd. And you do get stronger doing a winter season in 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 London. So I did that, which was great actually. It was actually very good. It was very good for your show. Mm -hmm. You really you tighten it up. You tighten it because you, you don't lose moments when you lose people. So. When it's cold, you really got to keep it tight mm -hmm. to make to make it to make strength as your show. It's quite extraordinary. And at the same time, I actually searched around and looked for a building, and I found a building in Hackney, the one that you've been to. Mm, oh yes. Yes, yeah, so I found out it was up for auction. The auction was in June, and um, so um, I said, okay, yeah, I really kind of like this building. It's big. That building's brilliant. Isn't it. So I was like, this building's amazing. I can juggle five clubs in there. You know, it's big space. It'd be great for me to juggle, and this is an amazing building. Wow, I could really, oh God, I've got, got, got flutters, you know, I've got rushes. Uh, it was in June, the auction. Um, so I went to Japan again in the spring, mm -hmm. did my sp spring season in Japan, did, did Mariyama Cohen again in Kyoto and, and Osaka, and did my usual season and saved some more money. And then when it came to the auction, uh, I was in Tokyo at the time, and I, I, I got my friend to go to the auction. I, I rang him up from, from a phone box in Tokyo. And I said, okay. So he was there. He goes, okay, yeah, it's bidding now. It's bidding now. So okay, we well, bid, bid, bid. I said, okay, <laughs> what is it bidding? It's seventy five thousand. I said, okay, bid, bid, bid. Okay, take it to eighty. He went, okay, eighty. It's gone, gone past eighty. I said, okay, bid it, bid it to eighty five. Okay, it's gone past eighty five. Okay, bid to ninety, bid to ninety. And then he, and then it, and he goes, he goes, oh, it's gone past ninety. He goes, okay, okay, take it to a hundred, take it to a hundred. Wow. And then he just went, okay, you've got it. <laughs> a hundred. Yeah. Okay, you've got it. He was so mellow about it. He's like, okay, you've got it. <laughs> Calm down now. See, <laughs> so that's how I bought the building. So amazing. Hackney, yeah. property, right? Yeah. I'd already bought a wood, actually. I bought a wood in Kent before that. Wood? Yeah, I bought a, a 10 acre wood. So um, I yeah, I, I bought a wood because um, I was a bit of a hippie, so. <laughs> I, I just found a wood. I thought the best thing I could buy would be a wood, a natural, something natural. Mm -hmm. So I bought a 10 acre wood in, in Kent for no money, for like 12,000 or something mm -hmm. before. But I don't know, this is like three years before. I see. I thought it was a nice thing to spend money on. I mean, you can get a car for 12,000. I got a wood. It's a massive wood. I thought, that's crazy. How can you buy a wood for 12,000 pounds? Still have it? Yeah. <laughs> Was it hard? It's a lovely wood. <laughs> <laughs> own personal wood yeah like, That's there's a farmer next door sadly a guy moved in next door he's been he's been chopping my wood down and fucking using the wood which is annoying what a dick yeah it's really annoying can you shoot him it's funny I've got to tell a farmer to get off my land <laughs> <laughs> bitch this is my wood get out of here yeah. <laughs> it's ironic what, so you've got wood you've got you've, you've just so I bought, the, bought the warehouse yeah uh, and then um, and sadly me and Alex split up around that time after I got the warehouse we split up about that time and she was doing her own thing as well. She mm -hmm. went to Spain and it was, we always kind of, always doing quite a lot of our own stuff as well. She often spent time away mm -hmm. and I had an affair sadly with, yeah. So it kind of, kind of fucked it all up, you know. But I thought you were madly in love with her. I was, but then, you know, I'm an idiot. I'm a man, you know, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there, so yeah, yeah. I, I understand how that works. Yeah. So I had an affair, actually with one of my friends, Girlfriends, it was really awful. I felt like my friend for a few years as well, but we made up in the end. Um, yeah, that's that's another that's a different story. Um, and then yeah, that happened. Then they basically kept going back to Japan, mm -hmm. and then slowly did the building up. Slowly, mm -hmm. I, I got some guys to move in there who pretty much squatted the place. <laughs> they pretty much squatted the place, and they did a really bad job on it. And I came back, I had to kick them out the next mm -hmm. the next year, and. I got some friends, I got some really great friends to work on it. I got a friend called Duncan who's an incredible steel worker and he did loads of stuff in there. Mm, yeah. And then um, I got another friend called Owen, he did all the electrics, mm -hmm. got certified and everything. I got basic friends to work on it. And over, it took six years from when I bought it to when it was kind of pretty much ready to, in a decent situation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's nice. It's, it's a nice building now, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay, I mean, it's, it's not really a clever development, it's a bit of a hippie, hippie place. But you know, it's it's functional. Yeah. It's a big hippie kind of vibe, isn't it? You see what it's like. Yeah, but it's so nice. It's like so spacious. Yeah, the loft upstairs. Yeah, I know, but it's it's not like a it's not, you know it's not like a developer's. It's not making as much money as it as it could if it was. Any okay. any developer would have cut it up, made it into a really 
you know, into a much more uh, money-making scheme, you know. It's a kind of really hippie paradise, isn't it? I guess you've changed then. <laughs> um, I guess you changed from the time when you were 15 where you're finding that every little way to make some money you're more doing in this kind of I've always had soul. a sort of I've always been a bit bit of both a bit of both you know you can <laughs> you know I'm not I am not bloody Bill Gates am I I'm not I'm not rich compared to the people that are rich in this world well <laughs> who is yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly exactly guys, you know I'm, still, I'm a little guy I'm a little man I'm a little man I'm not a you know I'm not a financial success compared to financial successes mm -hmm. the guys out there that are financially successful are you know properly successful you know i'm just a little i feel like i always felt like a, a bit of a little man you know i'm never i'm not i'm not you know you know what i mean i guess it's i mean but then it's the payoff success. the payoff the payoff is yeah i'm free you know i've always had a free uh, i always had my freedom in a way and um you know i and i've always enjoyed what i do so it's not like a I mean, if you look at your life, like, yeah. I don't know how many people out there can compare what you've done mm -hmm. and kind of where you are at now as well. So it's like, you know, you have a popular uh, comedy club in central London and, you know, say 10 years ago, you've been doing street, shows, shows. street performances. Yeah. Well, but who knew they, they were so lucrative. <laughs> well, you know, they were, I mean, yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, it's pennies. What you make on the streets is really pennies compared to what's really going on in the world. But, you know, it but, is really pennies. What you, but as long as you do what you love. Well, yeah, you, but you love, I loved it. And I, I mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't see, I couldn't find myself doing anything else. I wasn't, I couldn't, I wouldn't, I didn't see myself doing anything else at the time. I just did what, what so, I could see. That's what I want to ask is, did you start doing it? and then developed it into something that you just don't want to do anything else? Or has it always been that one thing that you just did it once and you're like, I want to do this forever? Um, I did, I did, well, when I, I can remember when I came to university in London, I came down to Common Garden, I saw someone do a street show mm -hmm. and he was juggling five balls on a unicycle. <laughs> Some Canadian dude. I was like, wow. I was like, wow. And I gave him money and I saw the crowd. I was like, he must have made 50 pounds from that show. He probably made a lot more, but at the time I was like 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. he, must, he must have made much, much more. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, he just did like half an hour's work and he made 50 pounds or 40 minutes work and made 50 pounds. I was like, why, if I could just do that, and then I'd be, then that's all I'd need, you know? And that's way back when I was, way, way back. Mm -hmm. Before I went to Japan, that's when I was probably just still at university. Mm -hmm. So I guess in a way it planted that seed that I kind of would, I kind of thought, why wow, I'd really love to be able to do that, you know? Interesting. Yeah, so maybe that was, that did, did sort of have a, yeah, I really wanted, that was so, give me a, a direction. So a direction, speak. yeah. That is so weird, that little thing, that's what made you, made you. Inspired. I met a few street performers at that time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I met so the guy who, who was on stilts and jumped out at people and he mentioned Japan. And then at one time I went to, one time I went to a rainbow festival in Poland uh, uh, when I was like 22 or something, went to this rainbow festival uh, and I met a guy there, a guy called Martin, Jim, a guy <gasps> oh, excuse me, who, who, did a, who could do street shows, little street shows. And he'd been in Japan doing street shows and he said, oh, you should go to Japan. A couple of people, a few people mentioned Japan, which is why I, I went, when I went to India, mm -hmm. I was like, we should go to Japan to my mates because a few people have mentioned this, this thing, this kind of like, you know, El, you know, El Dorado. You know that that mythical place. Yeah, yeah. You know where the pay, where everything's gold, and you know. Um, that's um, that's uh, what is it? Candide, isn't it? Uh, Candide by Voltaire. I think there's this mythical place in Candide mm -hmm. about this this. I think it's called El Dorado, where you, everything's made of gold, and you go there, and you you know it felt Japan was very much like that. It's this mm -hmm. paradise. It turned yeah. out to be one. <laughs> it turned out to be yeah. It turned out to be yeah. It was great. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so where are we through to now? So then we don't down to, uh, yeah, cover gun. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's okay. I don't sleep at the monk because the baby. I know. Right? Um, so anyway, yes, yeah, so then Covent Garden. And then, yeah, so basically I worked in Covent Garden pretty much throughout. I didn't really go back to it because I had my warehouse as well. I, work, I did do my warehouse. Mm. So I was developing a warehouse. I was, I was basically between, you know, doing the warehouse, mm -hmm. doing Covent Garden. Helping, I was always really interested in you know, really being hands-on with the building. Mm -hmm. I builders were there, but I was really hands-on doing it. I usually employed friends as well to do it. 
and it was yeah it slowly developed that building it took six years and then it was then it was just there you know done and I carried on doing Comic Garden after that mm-hmm. um, yeah and I relaxed for a little bit a couple of seasons went went to and skiing for a couple of seasons in the winter and started relax a little bit sorry oh, I got I got I got married to Claudia mm-hmm. at that time. Um, yeah, what else? I was still doing Japan. Every, of course, I was still doing Japan at that time. Sorry, every every spring and every autumn, I still go to Japan. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm not thinking. Fans back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go to Japan in the spring, Japan in the autumn, mm-hmm. and then I do London in, in the winters, in mm-hmm. the winter and the, and the summer. And then when I was with Claudia, I'd do that. So I'd be living it in that. Basically, I was having long distance relationship with Claudia. Mm-hmm. So I'd be in Japan. And eventually, the pitch dried up in Japan. One season, the pitch just dried up. Really? Uh, yeah, they, 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 uh, there was a problem with the pitch. The main, the main pitch I worked in Yokohama, which is a fantastic pitch, like an amphitheater, mm-hmm. next to a place called um, Landmark Tower. Mm-hmm. And there's a, a park down the road. <sighs> oh, sorry. The park down the road called Yamashita Cohen, Yamashita Park. Mm-hmm. And then there's these two great pictures. They were fantastic pictures. And I kind of just, I'd settled in Japan. I'd got, I'd got a little, I had a little place I could stay near there. And I really had my routine. And I, I used to work every night in, in the, in Lama Thai every weekend between the park and Lama Thai. I had a great routine there. And I used to go for three months in the spring, three months in the autumn, have a good income. And, um, it was great. I was actually, yeah, I actually didn't spend much time in the UK specifically for tax purposes as well because I wasn't I wasn't actually a, a resident at that point oh. yeah for quite a long time I was I was not a resident in the UK um, anyway um, so eventually the pitch dried up in Japan there was a problem with the pitch one of the street performers there offended some audience members who happened to be some of the top guys from Mitsubishi and it turned out these guys in the crowd in the, in the show were the Mitsubishi owned that space uh, that space actually isn't public land. It's owned by it's all mm-hmm. owned by Mitsubishi. So the the whole space because this guy had offended them and been rude to them in their eyes, mm-hmm. um, they said, "Right, there's no more street shows here." Shit. And they closed the pitch down for a season. And then so I got this call saying, "Mark, Mark, the pitch is closed." I was like, "Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Fuck off." <laughs> and then no, no, really, it's really closed. This is what happened. I carried to these lines. So they've closed it down. I was like, well, fuck, I won't come back. I said, in that case, I, t- I took the autumn off and I concentrated on doing my warehouse. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of, my whole Japan thing dwindled and just went down, down, down. And, it's, and then I became much more involved in London, doing street shows in London. Mm-hmm. And then fast forward a number of years, and I had a good time in London. I fucked around. I had a bit of a laugh. I, my, I, my relationship with Claudia broke down. I, 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 had loads of, I had loads of great sex, lots of different people. I kind of played around. I was really, I did, I was just stupid. I was stupid for years. Well, not stupid. I was fucking had fun, you know. Yeah, I went life. skiing. I, I learned to snowboard. I, re, I was really got into snowboarding. I just had a really fun time for a couple, two or three years. And then, um, and then, that, and then after that, I started getting into this. Uh, I started doing a bit of stand up, open mic thing. I'm I was really bad at it. I was so bad. I was so bad. So bad. So bad. So, bad, so terrible. And then, um, so fucking bad and then um and then and then um oh yeah i the, i got elected i got a problem in common garden mm-hmm. banned from doing street shows in common garden how, um, how can you be banned i was doing my street show as i always had and these scoot guys came on the pitch and said no 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 chainsaws in the west i was like what they said no chainsaws in the west i was doing chainsaw juggling down there for eight years before that what the fuck I was like, I was like, what the fuck? I said, let me finish the show. I'll come talk to you. And then, uh, and they, they, they I didn't finish my street show. Went up. They walked into my show, which is a real no-no as well. So anyway, I finished the street show. Went up to the office. Said, yeah, no more street, sh- no more chainsaws in the West. You can't. You can. I said, what are you saying? I'm banned. I said, no, you're not banned. You can't do chainsaws anymore. I said, well, that's my finale. I nice. said, so what do you mean I can't do street shows anymore? It's like a management. Or- yeah, yeah. And I said, what's going on? They said, oh, there's been complaints. Westminster Council. I phoned at Westminster Council. I spoke to this guy in the Westminster Council. Um, and he said, yes. He said, yes, there's been complaints. Uh, I hear you're wearing a G-string. You know, it's not suitable for families. Uh, I said, it's comedy. He said, no, no. I said, I said, he, said, he said, no, you can't. He goes, you can wear tight-fitting pants, but nothing else. He goes, you're exposing yourself. I said, no, I'm exposing myself. You know, I said, this is ridiculous. So he, he said this thing. He goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, you can, he goes, <laughs> he goes, you can wear d- trunks, but it's really sort of weird and sort of 
<laughs> you know, it's really repressed, you know, you can wear trunks. <laughs> uh, and I said, oh, God. I said, well, okay, so I, so I went straight to a solicitor. I said, right, this is fucked. I've been here for eight years. I went straight to a solicitor. Mm -hmm. I went to an employment solicitor. I said, look, is this possible? I've been doing a show for eight years. And um, uh, they've told me I can't do my show anymore. I've been doing it every day for eight years. It, I mean, it, do I have any rights as an as a employment law? Mm -hmm. And she goes, yeah, I think you do. So she, she made one nice. call to Westminster Council. And she goes, yeah, it's blah, blah, blah here, QC. I'm acting on behalf of Mark Rothman. I understand you've stopped him working. I, and she said a few things to you on the phone. They let me back in again. Ha! One call, oh, one, call counsel. one call, one call is, inc is, is insane, this guy. Yeah. This guy was an idiot. And so she, uh, so I was like, thank you very much. There's, there's 250 quid for you an hour's, an hour's work. And I was straight back in. Uh, I, mean, I said, look, if, 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 if the G-string's an issue, I'll, I'll wear some bloody hot pants, I don't care. You know, if 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 I need to compromise a little bit to show good, to show willing, to show that I'm not belligerent, I wear hot pants. And she said, "Oh yeah, Mr. Rothman's happy to do this." You know, if you, you <laughs> I know, love that conversation. The, the, the cha the, you know, the chains. He said, so the chainsaw is way too dangerous. I said, what do you mean it's dangerous? I, I showed him the chainsaw. It, it doesn't. It wouldn't cut. You know, it doesn't cut. I said, "You think I'm using? Like you think I'm using a chainsaw? You fucking crazy? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a prop. You're acting like an idiot. You're acting like a member of the public. You're acting like." You know, you know when when Houdini, you know, escapes, he's, he's a trick. He's not really escaping. You know, you're acting like a fool. Yeah. He, of course, it's not dangerous. You know what I mean? You're not going to be juggling in the rule chainsaw. Yeah, yeah. Of, of course you're not. I don't mean, you think I'm stupid. Mm -hmm. No, you're you're acting like a stupid idiot. You're acting like you're acting like the public that you know I'm trying to entertain. Yeah. The whole point is to make it look dangerous when it's not dangerous. Mm, exactly. You're a fool. So anyway, so then I was back in there. To me. I think they banned me on a Tuesday. I was back in there by the weekend, you know. Okay. So when that happened, um, the Common Garden Street performers have, have reps. We have representation, mm -hmm. so that so that there's, there's a that performers don't usually represent themselves. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a like a, the management in Common Garden mm -hmm. and the council, and there's a there's a people that represent the performers, so that you, you don't get performers going streaming, you know, arguing with the management. It's just like this. It's, it's, we've always had reps in Common Garden for the mm -hmm. last thirty years. Uh, in fact, the first rep was Eddie Izzard. Who's, a, who's one of the biggest stand-ups in the world, you know, mm. historically. You don't know much about stand-up, but anyway. So, so anyway, so there's always been reps the last 30 years or so mm. in Common Garden. And at that time, the two reps hadn't done a great job of representing me. Mm. They hadn't really done a brilliant job. I was like, well, where's my representation here? Where's? And it transpired in the end, because I re represent myself, because I got back in again, that the, the people, the, the street performer was like, oh, Mark's done a good job here, you know. He's, you know, he's stood it for himself. He's, mm -hmm. You know, he's got banned and now he's back. And then they, they turn around and said, oh, would you like to be a rep? I was like, I'd love to be a rep. I'd love to be a rep. I mean, that's great. For me, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's, mm -hmm. that's me. I didn't imagine, I was really, I was so touched that, you know, that I could become a rep, a rep representing the street performers. Like, for me, that's like a real honor, you know? Mm -hmm. So I started to rep the performers. They, they voted and said, yeah, I could be a rep. And um, I started to rep the performers and then, um, and then, I, I really, you know, I take things very seriously. I'm quite OCD about things, mm -hmm. obsessive. So one of the things I wanted to do as a rep was to find somewhere for us to store our equipment. Mm -hmm. Because the, the hardest thing doing street shows isn't just doing the show. The show is hard enough. But harder than that is getting your props to pitch, especially if you've got a lot of props. Mm -hmm. Getting that stuff to pitch is a real pain in the ass. Unicycles, amplifiers, chainsaws, whatever you've got, ropes, you know, you've got big cases, you've got a lot of equipment usually mm -hmm. to do a street show. And it's... It's a nightmare, you know. Often you work like you're not out on a bus, or the, you know you have something on a tube. You got trolleys, and your trolleys breaking because there's no lifts, and mm -hmm. you know it's just a real, a real amount of work. It's a physical nightmare getting props to the pitch. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought, right, the best thing I can do for the performers is to get a storage area. Mm -hmm. So I managed to find a storage space around the corner in King Street in this place called the Africa Centre. It was this dingy little basement space. It was a disused, almost disused building called the Africa Centre in King Street. Uh, this is many years ago now, and it was weird. It was weird that I managed to found it. It was weird that this building was empty, mm -hmm. but I managed to get this, this place, and uh, I started renting this basement space for the performers. And it was great because we we had a collective pot of money, mm -hmm. and we used to keep that money in case we had any problems, you know, legal fees, whatever. We kept. I set up the street form with SBA treasury thing, so we had a, a bank account, so we had we had a pot of money in case we had any problems, you know, mm -hmm. and um, rented this space in the Africa Centre. 
And then, and then I started doing a bit of, bit of um, open mic, which I was really bad at. I, mean, I can't say how bad I was at it. I'm really bad, bad. I'm really, really bad. I started doing that. And then I started running a little open mic. One of the guys said, oh, you seem like, I used to come and help him set up, mm -hmm. set the mic and do a bit of flowering. So I took over his open mic for like four months just to help him out. And then when he took it back, I then asked the Africa Center if I could use one of their rooms. They had a, this building was empty and we had the storage at the front and there's another room in the back on the, mm -hmm. in the basement which was this old restaurant and I, I said I wrote six months of emails trying to get these guys to let me use it and after six months I said okay you can use it one night a week every Friday I could do a comedy night in there and that's how I started the club All right. yeah so yeah so it came from being a rep to getting my foot in the door of this building and then finding another room in the building mm -hmm. and then uh, yeah I started doing one night comedy there Fridays Flowering in Common Garden, flowering in my show. I used to fly after my show, you know, and, and get people to come down. I, and then we started having a little flyer team for the club, mm -hmm. and giving out flyers in the Common Garden Tube and the Leicester Square Tube, and creating some street. We didn't have a website for a little while because I was stupid. We, start, we, we had this thing on the streets with 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 you know paper flowering. Yeah, and we used to get an audience. Really we used to get an audience every, every Friday, filled mm -hmm. it up. You know, we had one pound fifty drinks. All drinks one pound fifty. We used to get drinks from Tesco's, sell them in the bar. The, the, the Africa Center had a license, so we could sell alcohol there. Nice. It was brilliant. It was amazing. So I started that. I just had a real, I was really, very lucky to get the opportunity. And then I petitioned the Africa Center to start doing Saturdays and Fridays. Fridays was going well. So I started doing Fridays and Saturdays. It took me another six months to get Saturdays going. Mm -hmm. And then once the Saturday was going, I started emailing again, again. I said, Let, let's do Wednesdays, Thursdays. It took another six months. They said, okay, Wednesdays, Thursdays. And then I, I emailed again. <laughs> Six months more, <laughs> and, I, and then and then they said I could do Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, so three more days, and then what? Then I was already doing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. So then I had a whole seven days a week. Yeah. It took so after I opened on it in the July, and then a year and a half later, I was doing seven days a week. Shit. And two days le two years later, they sold the building, and I got kicked out. You got kicked out. Yeah, yeah. Two two years later after that, I was going for three and a half years there, and then two years. Yeah, so three and a half years altogether, mm -hmm. and they kicked me out uh, in the in the September. Uh, I can't remember which year it was now. Nine, uh, two thousand thirteen, I think. Okay. Yeah. And how did you move to where you? And then, then yeah, then when they when they told me that they said right, you got two weeks to get out. Mm -hmm. and I was like fuck. And uh, two weeks. yeah, two weeks. Yeah. Two and then, so I searched around Common Garden. I found that basement space mm -hmm. uh, where I am now. And it was run by this guy called Mohammed, the, the restaurant. And he, he was doing nothing in the basement. So I did a deal with Mohammed, moved to the basement and started the club there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. And then you, you bought, bought out the place? I, bought my, I eventually bought the whole lease of Mohammed, yeah. We had mm -hmm. so much hassle with each other. It was a big fight. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you know, I bought the lease off him and the rest is history. You know, he got loads of money. I got the lease. <laughs> it was a lot of stress, but it, yeah, it worked out. It worked out, in there. Yeah. No, you have a successful... No, it's there, yeah. Go it's get, yeah, it's there. Pretty much. How do how would one go into comedy club to perform? So uh, because last time uh, I've been there, you have quite a few you know new people who just want to try themselves out in the comedy. They can, can just come. Well, and generally people work, work the way work the way up through the open mic scene and get get good on the open mic scene. Once you get good at the open mic scene, then you then you got a good five ten minutes, and then you can apply to get to come, oh, come and do okay. yeah. An open mic. Where do you? How, how do you do that? Uh, there's a scene in London. I mean, it's, it's not good at the moment because of the uh, pandemic. But, um, you know, there's a big up mic scene for musicians and for stand-ups, mm -hmm. you know, and for a variety of artists as well. Open mic is basically where you, where you go and you, you don't get paid and you get, you get, but you get an audience and you go and try and do your thing, you know. Mm -hmm. An open mic circuit is open mic circuits in every city. Mm -hmm. It's just people trying to do stuff, music or comedy or whatever. Whatever happens. Awesome. Yeah. Playing with that idea yeah. in my head. <laughs> yeah, if you want to do it, it's got no Google Open Mic Comedy mm -hmm. and get a, get a five minute spot. After your stories, Jesus fucking Christ! Like by my age, you travelled all around the world and just been making good money and freaking doing doing what you've been doing. And I'm like, I need to do something in my fucking life. Oh no! <laughs> Where am I? What am I doing? So well, what like, age are you? Uh, uh, How old are you? Twenty four. You'd have to worry till twenty seven. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said that, I was like, mm, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah it's really nice. It. It's a very liberating thought. Yeah. And it really helped me. Mm -hmm. Really helped me. You don't have to worry till you're 27. And then you figured that out. By yeah, then. by then you figured it. Because you're relaxed. Yeah, yeah. Also, you've done. If, you do, if you're passionate about whatever you're doing, if you're passionate about the thing you do, then you, it often leads somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. So you do things that you like and they're passionate about. I don't know what you're passionate about. That's the thing. You, you, well, you have to try. 
yeah, I mean, you're doing this podcast thing, so you're obviously passionate about that, right? That's pretty interesting, yeah. So there you go. <laughs> you meet people if on you, YouTube, it's fucking nice. <laughs> it's got to find, yeah, I guess, you do what makes you happy and what makes you, what, you know, you allow your passion to mm-hmm. do that. Don't yeah. get distracted by shit, by shit you're not passionate about, I guess. I love that. You remind me of Gary Vee. <laughs> Who's that? Uh, he's an, an entrepreneur from America, but he's like all about, you know, do what you love and love what you do. Yeah. Be passionate about Just forget about the fucking rest. Forget yeah. about what people think. Just do what you want to do. Yeah. He's just all, all about that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That sounds, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we've been around for like two hours and a bit now. Is it? <laughs> yeah. So I hope you're going to cut down to like 10 minutes because a lot of that was shit. No, it's going to go all of it, two hours out there. <laughs> Don't do but that. I'm going to cut into small bits. No, definitely cut a little. Like, please cut all the shit out. It's too much boring shit there. <laughs> we, we don't cut in this podcast. You don't? No. You're fucking joking, aren't you? No. It's going to be like, it is, it is what it is. You really? Know? Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> I probably edited, I would have, I would have deliberately edited, edited myself more if I'd known that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. That's embarrassing. Uh. But then um, I, I do cut out, uh, I don't cut out that, so on YouTube is going to be like as a whole thing, but like probably minor things, you know, when somebody distracted us like on, on the phone or whatever it may be. It's, please cut out the boring shit, I beg you. But there's no boring shit in there. <laughs> fucking it is. Where? I don't like, know. Like trust me, w- once it's done, I'll send it to you, you'll be like, there's no boring shit in here. It's oh, like fascinating be, stories. I won't From be able to watch it. Have you been seven? <laughs> okay. <laughs> To now, it's been, it's just been a blast. Okay, well, you're yeah. a very charming man. <laughs> <laughs> Not charming as you, clearly. <laughs> okay, All right. should we leave it there then? Yeah, yeah, let's end it there. Thank you very much. Oh, nice one. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> for joining. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> All right, Sweet. done. Okay, nice. Oh. Cool.